Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Vicky Murillo, the director of the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University. And I want to welcome all of you to this final meeting of the conference on the crisis of political responsiveness and the stretching of populism, Latin America in Comparative Perspective, organized by the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University. First, I want to thank Esteban Andrade and Monica Trigos for their crucial work in the organization of all the different meetings of this conference. Um, and we did, without their help, this would have not been possible. Second, I want to let you know uh, that the three prior panels have been recorded and they are now available in our YouTube channel and in the ELAS webpage. Um, and that this roundtable and keynote panel will also be recorded, recorded and will also be available. And I guess by, uh, by participating, you're agreeing to this recording. Um, and so the, the, this last meeting has two parts, a round table where we're going to start spreading our discussion. The first three panels were on Latin America. We're now you know, introducing the rest of the world to the discussion. And then we will have two uh, crucial keynote speakers for another conversation. So let me introduce the panelists for the round table uh, who I have the honor, they are all my colleagues. So I'm pretty thrilled to be hosting this. Um, we have Tim Fry, who is the Marshall Schulman Professor at Columbia University and the director of the International Center for the Study of Institutions and Development at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. And his most recent book, Weak Strongman, The Limits of Power in Putin's Rus Russia, is coming out in like a couple of weeks, right? Right. So available you should for all pre-order. <laughs> available for pre-order, so you all should be already signing up in Amazon. <laughs> Sherry Berman is a professor of political science at Barnard College, Columbia University. She's an expert on European politics and political development, the left, fascism, populism, and democracy. Her latest book is Democracy and Dictatorship in Europe from the Ancient Regime to the Present Day. She has published widely, not just in academia, but also in the press, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and so on. And I just learned she holds an honorary degree from Uppsala University in Sweden. Pretty cool. Bob Kaufman is the Distinguished Professor of Political Science at Rutgers University. Although he also teaches at Columbia University, and he has written widely on authoritarianism and democratic transition and on the political economy of economic reforms. His current research focuses on backsliding in democratic regimes in Latin America, other developing and post-communist countries, as well as the United States. Most recently, he has co-authored, as long as many other books that he has co-authored, with Steve Hagar, Backsliding, Democratic Regress in the Contemporary World, coming up which just came out last year with Cambridge University Press, and Dictators and Democrats, Elites, Masses, and Regime Change with Princeton University Press. Uh, Justin Phillips is a professor uh, of political science at Columbia University. His research interests include public opinion, state and local politics, the American culture war, and LGBTQ rights. His recent publications include The Party of the Purse, and Equal Representation in the US Senate, Gay Rights in Congress, Public Opinion and Misrepresentation, and his book, The Power of American Governors, Winning on Budgets and Losing on Policy. Thank you all of you for agreeing to participate in this roundtable. The format will be, we will start with presentation, 10 to 15 minutes, um, and then we will open to questions. I will ask uh, some questions and also we'll take questions from the audience. You can use the Q&A function to write down your questions and I will read them to the panelists. Thank you very much to all of you for agreeing to participate. The order we have agreed that Bob will start followed by Sherry, then Tim, and then Justin. Bob. Okay, well, let me start by sharing my screen. Yeah, so um, first of all, thank you, uh, Vicki and Esteban and uh, Monica for, uh, for organizing this. And thank you for inviting me. I've been at all the previous sessions and, um, uh, and have learned a lot from them. So, so thank you. Let me put this in. So um, I, in my comments, I 
we want to focus not so much on populism as a phenomenon, but talk about the way in which populists um, gain uh, power and consolidate power. And in doing that, I want to draw on my book with, uh, that I've just uh, uh, published with Steph Haggard, um, which I am shamelessly uh, promoting. Uh, uh, on the screen, it's called, the full title is Backsliding uh, Democratic Regress in uh, the Contemporary World. So we define backsliding in terms of um, really of two features. One is the, it's incrementalism that uh, democratic institutions are subverted uh, little by little. Uh, and secondly, that this, uh, this process results from the uh, action of, of duly elected governments. So, um, and this we think is in contrast to uh, other forms of democratic, uh, uh, the death of democracies, coups, revolutions, and so forth. And the empirical cases um, are here on the slide. Um, the, Latin, the Latin American cases include kind of iconic episodes of populism in Venezuela, Ecuador, and Bolivia. Uh, also, our book also includes Turkey, which is another case. And, then uh, we trespassed into the post-communist world uh, with, um, with work on Hungary and Poland and Russia for that matter. So a little nervous since Tim is here. Uh, so this is our argument. Um, uh, it's uh, it's uh, a little misleading because actually I, at least I feel like the arrows could point uh, at least in some cases in both directions uh, rather than, than one. Uh, but it does kind of capture the, the kind of causal components of our, of our argument. Uh, uh, polarization is a, a key element in that. Uh, uh, but uh, in addition to that, of course, uh, autocrats, populists have to win power. Uh, so if you look down the left-hand side, the next step is um, capturing the executive. And then another very, very important, we feel is very important component of the backsliding process is controlling the legislature. And I'll talk, uh, I'll talk more about that uh, down the road, but that's in our judgment a kind of pivotal um, uh, component. And what we don't have in, the, in, the, in this little chart is the incrementalism of the backsliding process. Uh, but I'll, I'll get to that late, later. So polarization. Uh, uh, there's been a good deal of discussion of this already uh, in the workshop and elsewhere. So I, I'm going to make this a, a short story. It's actually a long one. And what we understand that bipolarization is a process um, that divides society into to us them binaries. So it's a matter of affect or identity. Uh, we build here on McCoy, Romney, and Summer, and Yingar. Um, uh, uh, and uh, empirically, we uh, spend a lot of time in, in country narratives uh, talking about the dynamics and sources of polarization in each of the cases. But uh, in the book itself, we rely heavily on PDEM indicators of polarization. Um, uh, and we show that, in fact, you see these indicators uh, ticking up uh, substantially here prior to or during uh, the onset of backsliding episodes, and also uh, that the indicators were uh, generally uh, significantly higher uh, than the regional averages, so that these countries that we've looked at were uh, typically more polarized than uh, the regional norms. Um, the, found, the social foundations vary, and so we really don't try to, you know, make a general kind of argument about the relative importance of cultural or ethnic or class cleavages. Uh, and uh, but you know, we kind of try to unpack those in the country narratives. And we also uh, are agnostic about any debate uh, about whether uh, polarization is stoked from above by populist entrepreneurs or whether it originates from 
below. Um, our take on this is generally that it's a kind of a question of both uh, 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 demand, supply and demand. Uh, you see, in most cases, things both you know entrepreneurs stoking these divisions, but also uh, playing on very deep underlying divisions in the society. And either way, um, uh, uh, you know, our our argument is that populism uh, transforms the polarization, transforms the political landscape, uh, one which uh, populists both create and exploit, and that uh, creates the foundation of the appeal that they make uh, uh, based on a notion which we talked about of society as uh, a conflict between the people uh, and the corrupt elite. So that, I think, is the, the kind of foundation of this. Now, the question, um, however, is how populists that make these appeals come to power. And um, we, in our view, uh, the backsliding process is set in motion when populists become heads of government. So the question is, how does that, how does that happen? Um, uh, one thing that we note is that institutions are really important and that the way to office for populists is not usually, uh, often at least, uh, paved by disproportionality um, of the electoral system or coordination figures by, by competitors. And a prime example of that is Trump, of course. But you also see a number of other cases where this is true, for example, in Nicaragua. Um, uh, Ortega is elected, first elected with only about a third of the vote. Uh, same thing with the law and justice in Poland. Uh, uh, another example is Correa, who is really a second round a winner, but only receives 22% uh, percent of the vote in the first round. So these, these are claimed to have, you know, be majoritarian. Uh, but in fact, uh, that is uh, kind of mis, uh, somewhat mis- uh, Leading. Uh, so now the second thing that we know is that executive power really isn't enough uh, to consolidate control and control of the, or at least full control. Full control of the legislature here is uh, pivotal. Um, uh, and in every case, I think, except Brazil, uh, legislative majorities became a platform for. Uh, the executive to extend uh, control to colonize other agencies of the state, uh, the judiciary, the civil civil society, and the electoral um, system. Uh, Brazil is an interesting exception because Bolsonaro doesn't control the legislature, and that has limited, uh, I think, his capacity to undermine the, the Brazilian system. Um, in uh, uh, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Bolivia constituent assemblies were very important in kind of establishing a legislative uh, dominance. Uh, but again, disproportionality is a really important part of the story. Uh, AKP in Turkey, Fidesz in Hungary, uh, won super majorities with just a plurality of the party. And uh, uh, ruling parties also converted plurality wins into parliamentary majorities in Poland, Serbia, United States, Russia, Macedonia, and uh, Zambia. So uh, the electoral system and kind of calculus of uh, opponents is a, cr a critical element of that. So when you control the legislature, they become platforms, as I've already argued, for political control. And they do this, I think, in at least four ways. First of all, and most fundamentally, they uh, are no longer instruments of oversight. So that's this, you know, increases uh, opportunity for political corruption, abuse of authority, and so forth. But in a more positive way, they also uh, play a, a kind of role in uh, uh, allowing executives to colonize the state. They ratify uh, the appointments of loyalists to key state agencies. Uh, they authorize restrictions on civil liberties and electoral competition. And then, uh, in many cases, they formally expand executive power, for example, by uh, abolishing uh, term limits. So let me turn finally to um, 
the question of incremental subversion. Um, I think most of us are aware of that, how that process works, and I'm not going to try to describe it in any detail. I will flash a couple of VDEM slides of, um, of uh, uh, elements of the backsliding process. And you see uh, in these slides that they, there's a kind of a step. They don't end democracy all at once. There's a kind of a down, uh, slope. And this is another slide of Turkey, which points uh, in the same uh, direction. So one question that we haven't fully resolved is whether uh, this incremental subversion is a causal component, in other words, whether it has causal effects or whether it's simply a descriptive uh, feature of, uh, of what backsliding is. I don't think we fully uh, unravel that. I mean, backsliding, uh, incremental deterioration does occur in a context of polarization, institutional capture. So, uh, you know, it's not clear whether what that adds. And I think we need more systematic kind of research into that. Uh, but I think it's a plausible hypothesis uh, that a series of relatively small abuse, uh, abuses can disorient uh, domestic uh, publics and, uh, uh, and normalize uh, uh, things that were steps that would not have been uh, accepted at an earlier point. We've certainly seen elements of that uh, in uh, the United States for Trump. 11 and minutes, Bob. I'm, to let this you know. is my last slide. Uh, uh, so, you know, unfortunately, I don't have a good conclusion to this. Uh, I think that the uh, there is some good news uh, that uh, in some of our countries, changes of government have uh, uh, brought uh, backsliding episodes to an end and uh, have opened up new opportunities to kind of rebuild something we talked about in the case of Bolivia, for example, earlier uh, in, the, in the, the program. Uh, and of course, if we can understand why backsliding happens, we can also find perhaps ways to prevent it. Um, but uh, having said that, I, you know, there's a lot going against you know, this. I mean, uh, there are very powerful international headwinds, the rise of Russia and China, uh, a, a huge flood of internet disinformation makes backsliding very hard at, at some level to uh, prevent. And then the third challenge, uh, uh, and I'll end with this, is the deterioration of democracy in the United States. And it seems to me that if the repairing the damage that's been done under Trump is not a sufficient way to halt global backsliding is, is very likely to be a necessary one. So thank you very much again. Uh, let me keep within my limit. Perfect. You are totally within your limit. This is great. Um, thank you, Bob. Sherry? Um, hi. So um, I also want to just begin by thanking um, Vicky and the Institute for Latin American Studies for inviting me um, to this panel with um, other great colleagues. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, populism, polarization and other topics in Europe. Um, if you look at the trends for um, populism in Europe, um, these um, populist type parties are not a new phenomenon. They start, most of them have their origins in the 1980s and we see a gradual increase in support for populist parties throughout the 90s and the beginning of the 21st century with some acceleration, not surprisingly around the time of the financial crisis. Right-wing populism is of course, a much more powerful force in Europe than left-wing populism. Um, and in some countries like France and um, Austria, these parties are extremely large. They're capable of vying for, um, you know, sort of control of government. We've even seen the rise of right-wing populist parties in European countries where we would not have expected to see them for a variety of reasons like um, Sweden um, and Germany, but nonetheless, we have powerful um, right-wing populist parties in um, almost all European countries at this point, even places, again, that up until relatively recently have seemed immune, places like Spain um, and perhaps now um, Portugal. Um, what I'm gonna talk about though, is there's a very interesting 
difference between um, the backstory of rising populism in Europe and that in the United States and some other parts of the world, uh, as Bob has just talked about. So when we talk about populism in the United States and in many other parts of the world, we also talk about polarization, as um, Bob just did. Um, and in fact, if you compare the trajectory in Europe and the United States, they went in exactly the opposite direction. So if we look back, for instance, at the post-war period in the United States, um, we had a party system where um, party identification and voter loyalty were relatively weak. Um, Democratic and Republican voters were relatively ideologically heterogeneous. Um, vote switching or split ticket voting, that is to say choosing, choosing different parties in um, uh, you know, national and state level elections um, was relatively common. Um, by the early 21st century, of course, as we know, the situation had changed dramatically in the United States. Partisan identities in the US had become much more deeply felt and entrenched. Um, Democratic and Republican voters had become more ideologically homogenous and distinct from each other, vote switching and split ticket voting had become relatively uncommon. Now, again, the trend in Western Europe is exactly the opposite. If we go back to the post-war period in Western Europe, right, you know, the 30 or so years after the Second World War, we had party systems in Western Europe that were dominated by two, generally, two major parties. On the left, we had social democratic or labor parties. On the right, we had Christian democratic or conservative parties. And these parties offered voters relatively clear, relatively consistent, and relatively distinct policy profiles. In addition, both mainstream parties of the left and right were organizationally strong. They had extensive ties to civil society organizations and interest groups, most notably unions on the left and business and religious groups on the right. Um, these ties help mobilize voters at election time and maintain their loyalty in between elections. As a result, in post-war Western Europe, partisanship was extremely high. Voters were, as scholars who study these party systems put it, strongly aligned with their parties during the post-war decades, right? Indeed, it was not uncommon during post-war decades in Western Europe, particularly on the left, for party membership to be seen as part of one's identity, right? Precisely as it is in the United States today and precisely as we bemoan it being in the United States today. Um, also, as in the contemporary United States, um, in post-war Western Europe, this combination of relatively clear and distinct party profiles, strong, party organizations, high political partisanship made post-war West European voting patterns relatively stable. Mainstream parties consistently garnered the votes of the vast majority of voters and electoral volatility, again, you know, sort of vote switching um, from one election to the next was relatively low, right? So for those of you who remember your comparative politics classes, this was the era when folks like Lipset and Rakan we're talking about party systems being frozen, right? That is to say, you know, you knew pretty much how people were gonna vote. You could guess relatively well what the percentage of the vote for different parties were gonna be. These were relatively entrenched fixed cleavages. We understood based on people's ascriptive and other characteristics, how they would vote. Now, just as the United States shifted during the late 20th and early 21st century, so did Western European party system shift but in the opposite direction from the United States, right? So the US, as we know, becomes more polarized, its party systems, as party system and voters do. But what we see in Western Europe is the opposite. We see convergence between the mainstream left and the mainstream right. Now this is driven most obviously by the shift of mainstream left parties, labor, social democratic parties to the center economically, right? So, you know, if you think about the late 20th century, this is the era of the third way in Britain, um, you know, similar kinds of shifts in Germany, other, um, you know, sort of European countries, right? Abandonment alongside with a sort of shift to the center economically, these parties also begin to abandon their strong class appeals, right? Their identities as working class parties, right? They sort of water down 
those appeals and that identity and their elites, party leaders, the people who make decisions within these parties shift from being folks who had um, roots in the labor movement or in the working class to being um, folks who come from, you know, the type of people we are, educated, upper middle class, elites, and technocrats. So there's a pretty marked shift from these on these part of these center left parties, but there's also a shift on the part of many center right parties as well. Again, you know, sort of traditional conservative and Christian democratic parties, right? Um, these parties um, shift to the center, many of them do on um, traditional, what you might consider cultural issues, um, uh, you know, moderating their positions on things like traditional values, immigration and other concerns related to national identity, right? Center right parties during the post-war period in Western Europe had traditionally taken, you know, moderately conservative stances on these issues, right? Christian democratic parties, for instance, had viewed religious values as well as traditional views on gender and the family as center to, central to their identities. Many of these parties understood national identity and cultural or even ethnic terms and were suspicious of immigration and multiculturalism, right? But during the late 20th and early 21st century, many of these parties again shift to the center on a lot of these issues, right? And they abandon a lot of these, what I would consider to be traditional, moderate, conservative positions on these issues, right? The most obvious example here is what happens with the Christian Democratic Party in Germany under um, Angela Merkel, right? Who shifts to the center, both economically and on cultural and social issues, although that party had shifted in important ways even before she came to office, most notably in accepting um, dual citizenship, a changing of citizenship rules in Germany, and so on. And if you look at studies, for instance, of European elites, um, both um, the people who run and are the decision makers in, again, center right and center left parties by the late 20th and early 21st century have views on a whole variety of issues that are in many ways somewhat more similar to each other than they are to many of the people that they represent, right? So what does this convergence do in Europe? It creates something that um, some political scientists refer to as a representation gap, right? That is to say a significant number of voters who by the late 20th, early 21st century feel that they are no longer represented by these two mainstream political parties, right? And we know who these people are, right? They're not entirely dissimilar to some of the people we identify as populist in the United States, right? Um, uh, workers and people with low education, most notably people with somewhat left-wing preferences on economic issues, but moderate to conservative views on cultural issues. We also see people who had traditionally been, again, conservative or Christian democratic voters with conservative views on cultural and social issues being dissatisfied with the shift to the center by their, you know, sort of ostensible, uh, the parties that they had voted for or would have voted for in the past, right? Now, when representation gaps emerge, that is to say, when the parties that exist no longer correspond to the preferences of the voters, um, you know, opportunities arise for new parties to um, develop or for existing parties to capture new voters, right? We should also expect when representation gaps open up that dissatisfaction will rise precisely because people feel that parties are no longer representing them. And this is exactly the story of Western Europe. There's actually a similar story in Eastern Europe, but I know that um, less well and I, um, so I'll, I won't talk about that, although I'm happy to talk a little bit about it in the Q&A, but perhaps Tim will discuss that as well. So what we have in Western Europe, again, during the late 20 and early 21st century is a whole bunch of these dissatisfied voters who feel they are not represented any longer by the two main parties shifting their support to these new populist parties. Again, mostly on the right, but in some countries on the left. Um, so let me just conclude with a few, um, you know, sort of a few comparative remarks since that's the point of this panel, right? Um, one thing I think that the West European case makes clear is that polarization, it's discussed by most people as inherently bad. Um, and I think that that has become the sort of standard story of the last years because the United States is such an obvious example of polarization. Studies have shown, for instance, that American um, elites now are more polarized on cultural issues than they've been um, you know, at any time in the modern past. And this development, by the way, is something that's happened largely over the last 
um, decades or so. Um, there's a great new book out by Noam Gidron and some others about polarization and comparative perspective that makes this clear, right? But polarization itself is not inherently bad, right? And I think the West European case makes that clear, right? It can be bad, but it need not be, right? It wasn't bad in post-war Western Europe, but it is bad in contemporary, in the contemporary United States. And I think this has something to do with the nature of polarization and not just the degree of polarization. And I'm happy to talk more about that. The second thing that the European comparison makes clear is that convergence can very much um, be as um, causal a factor in the rise of populism as polarization, right? That is to say that the rise of polarization, the rise, I'm sorry, the rise of populism in Western Europe fed not off the polarization of the two mainstream parties, but rather their convergence. Now that obviously has something to do with the type of party systems we have in Western Europe. But again, I think it's very clear that, you know, we want to think comparatively, um, lest we attribute causal significance to, trend, to, to trends or variables a contextually, right? And I think this is why comparative panels like this are so useful, right? Because it's very hard to know, you know, what the causal significance of particular factors are if we limit ourselves only to particular cases and particular time periods. Um, so I think that um, these kinds of panels um, are very, as I said, very useful. I've been really happy to participate in more of them over the last 10 years as people have begun to see a whole variety of cross-national trends and have begun thinking much more carefully about how um, these trends play out in different historical and comparative contexts. And I think um, we learn a lot more by, um, by thinking about these issues in that kind of way. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. This is very, very nice and, and very much in line with Ken Roberts' presentation on Latin America last, uh, last panel. Uh, let's move to Tim Fry now, and then we'll have the general conversation after, after Justin. Yes, Tim. Thanks, thanks a lot, Vicky. Thanks a lot to the organizers and the panelists. It's really a, a pleasure um, to uh, uh, just to hear everybody's diverse views on the topic. I think that's uh, really important. And a center like ELAS is really ideally situated to host a, a, an event like this. So uh, my uh, presentation is going to be somewhat similar to Bob's, but with a slightly different focus, and it is going to look at whether populism is a gateway drug for autocracy. Um, this is a somewhat common argument. Uh, Andrea Kendall Taylor and Erica Franz had a nice article in Foreign Policy making the case. And uh, I want to look at uh, five cases where arguably populist leaders come to power in relatively free and fair elections, but the outcomes uh, differ quite a bit. So we see backsliding in all these cases, but in some cases, the backsliding is much smaller than in others, right? So if we think about uh, Russia under Putin, Turkey under Erdogan, Hungary under Orban, Venezuela under Chavez, these are all cases where populist leaders come to power, really seriously undermine democratic institutions and create what are essentially authoritarian governments. Um, we, we can think of the US case under Trump as also a, a populist leader coming to power where democracy gets damaged in important ways, but holds in, in, in very um, uh, uh, in important ways as well, at least uh, for the moment. Along the way, I'll make some references to the Czech Republic under Babish and Poland under Kaczynski. And again, we see leaders who are populist, who had similar intentions of undermining the government who uh, also lead to somewhat different outcomes. So first question is, you know, are we justified in treating these cases as populist? Obviously, you know, if we think in terms of policies, um, uh, uh, it's hard to lump these cases together, Trump and Orban and uh, Chavez and Putin had very different ideas on economic policy. But if we think in terms of what, uh, about how Cass Moody and others think of populism more as, uh, an, uh, uh, as a kind of thin-centered ideology that's really rooted in this fundamental antagonism between a corrupt elite and a pure people, then I think you know, there is something in these cases that allows us to look at them together. Um, in all these cases, we see that populists argue that politics should be really an, uh, an expression of a general will unmediated by institutions like parties or legislatures, and that these individuals are really the only ones capable of representing uh, uh, this general will. I think that's 
you know, this fundamental antagonism between uh, this corrupt elite and a, and a pure populace is really the, the kind of essential uh, idea that allows us to compare these cases uh, together. There's also some kind of less essential commonalities, but that are also intriguing. Um, you know, this kind of very essentialist treatment of the nation, the scapegoating of others, be they uh, minorities or foreigners, frequently couch an anti-Western sentiment, emphasis on traditional values, on hyper-masculinity. Even if the leaders aren't very masculine, I'm looking at you, Donald Trump, uh, but they do try to, to play this card to, to varying degrees, okay? So I think we can all see these countries as um, you know, facing a similar uh, situation in which you have a populist leader who comes to power uh, intent on seriously undermining democracy, but we get you know, pretty different outcomes when we look a little bit closely. And one of the interesting things in these cases is that they don't really map neatly onto a lot of the usual suspects uh, that we look for when we're trying to account for political outcomes. We have federal and unitary states, presidential and parliamentary states, longstanding democracies and newish democracies, stronger and worse um, uh, economic performance. And none of these really correlate very well with uh, uh, the outcomes uh, in these cases. Bob's right to point to the uh, disproportionality that allows, um, in some cases, uh, leaders to get elected and really exaggerate their political power once uh, uh, they come into office. But a lot of the other things that we would usually look for um, aren't really all that helpful in thinking about um, uh, in thinking about these cases. So institutions are important, but a lot of the ones we usually think about being as important appear to be um, less so, at least in these cases. So one factor I think that's often overlooked um, is the really high levels of personal popularities that some of these leaders are able to obtain prior to their attempts to undermine uh, legislative institutions. So we can talk about Russia, for example, where Putin has averaged a 75% approval rating between 2000 and 2020. Uh, now there's also lots of reasons to believe that these ratings are accurate. Um, uh, I've done a bunch of work on this topic and we can't really uh, provide any evidence that uh, people are dissembling on any large scale uh, when they answer the question about whether or not they approve uh, Putin's approval rating. Um, uh, and when Putin first came to power, it's often forgotten, but the real question was, whether he would be able to overcome the opposition of the powerful oligarchs and regional governors who really held sway when he came to power, um, rather than were the institutions in Russia strong enough to, to constrain this leader who had never held public office before, never run for office, and was not really well known uh, prior to um, being named prime minister a few months before um, the election. Uh, we can, if we look at Erdogan, for example, after 2016, after the coup, his approval ratings are very high uh, on the order of 70%. And this allows him to vastly ex uh, increase executive powers uh, via a referendum. Chavez in Venezuela has his 80% approval rating shortly after coming uh, to power that he parlays into constitutional changes that allow him to expand executive control. Um, Orban too has these resounding victories um, in part because of uh, you know, his party's popularity in their platform, but also because of the opposition um, seriously discrediting itself uh, while they were in power, in part for some of the reasons that uh, Sherry identifies of abandoning their core constituencies um, on the left. Um, also admitting um, in a leaked tape that they had lied to the IMF about um, uh, how they had used budget funds also did not help their cause. Um, so uh, in all of these cases, we see um, uh, 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 leaders or parties who are able to achieve high rates of personal uh, 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 pop, uh, uh, popular approval, and they're able to use that to bully uh, uh, pol the political opposition um, uh, uh, today and to deter challengers from um, uh, 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 rivaling them. Um, and it allows them to make these kind of deep institutional changes. So one of the uh, points I wanna make here is that the 
uh, the key issue here is how can we prevent temporarily popular or relatively popular politicians from encoding that temporary popularity into long-term institutional uh, changes. And um, often the, these popularity ratings are uh, not necessarily rooted in charisma, you know, not all, you, you can make a case that, uh, uh, you know, some of these leaders suffer from charisma deficits. Um, uh, you know, Orban is not exactly what one thinks of as a, you know, very charismatic finger, y Yachinsky in Poland, even Putin is, is hardly a riveting uh, speaker uh, by, by any stretch or, you know, well known. But one thing we do see is that often these high approval ratings are rooted in strong economic performance. If we think about the Russian case, you know, people's living standards basically doubled between 1998 and 2008. Um, and this uh, uh, allow in, in Putin's popularity ratings closely track underlying economic conditions. Um, and then we see when uh, 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 his approval ratings start to fall, he annexes Crimea, which is an incredibly popular um, a policy. And this again allows him to even further aggrandize his power. So there we have these um, uh, you know, in Hungary, we can see that economic performance was really strong, in part because of the this exogenous in, in, uh, infusion of money from the European Union. Uh, in Venezuela, the high oil prices also contribute to uh, 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 Hugo Chavez's popularity. So these kind of exogenous um, economic forces, um, uh, I think, play a, a kind of primary role. Uh, that gives leaders uh, leverage um, to expand their powers in a lot of the ways that, that um, uh, Bob described um, kind of uh, down the road. Now, if we think about uh, the US case, um, uh, uh, there's lots of reasons people have pointed to about why the populist leader was then unable to um, uh, uh, you know, encode his, uh, uh, changes to the constitution or changes in laws that would greatly expand presidential power. And, you know, in some cases, people point to, you know, election officials in Georgia, uh, judges that overrule these cases, and that's all, um, you know, that's all well and good. Uh, but I think we also need to appreciate that Trump has been historically unpopular. Um, you know, he's the only president in the modern era who never had a 50% approval rating. Um, he won office with just 46% of the vote in 2016. Only Wilson, Nixon, and Clinton won the presidency with smaller shares. And each of these uh, three presidents had strong third party candidates running. Um, you know, Trump had a uh, um, uh, unified government in 2016 to 2018, um, but the majority in the Senate was rather thin. Um, and then he had, uh, then he had um, uh, divided government from uh, uh, 2018 uh, uh, and after. So, you know, kind of his kind of uh, ability, his raw power in terms of trying to translate um, his personal popularity into, uh, uh, you know, bullying um, political opponents or uh, members of his own party was more limited, one could argue, than some of the other uh, cases that we've seen. Um, also, if we think about, you know, the Czech Republic is, a, is another case where we have, um, uh, uh, you know, a populist leader, Bobby who comes to power. But if you look at kind of polls of voting intentions, you know, it never reaches uh, uh, the, the kind of stratosphere of some of the, these other, other cases. So um, just a couple points to wrap up. So to prevent populism from undermining democracy, one key is figuring out how to prevent leaders from translating these short-term boosts in approval rating into long-term institutional changes. And one key issue is the kind of the coherence of the, the opposition party um, uh, uh, as being able to um, uh, uh, provide a kind of clear and sensible alternative uh, uh, to, uh, to a leader who might be uh, temporarily uh, uh, popular. Also now, I've only looked primarily at the cases where leaders with populist intentions have been elected, but you know, there's also this deeper question of why leaders with populist intentions uh, have been elected in some countries and not others. So, you know, uh, I think, Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, 
would have been much more fertile ground than Hungary for Poland or Poland uh, for the kinds of populism that we've seen. Uh, but I think we've all been surprised that really it was, it's been Hungary and to a lesser extent Poland that have seen the, the most egregious forms of backsliding uh, in Eastern Europe. And we could also think of, you know, why the US and not Canada, you know, if we want to think about comparative uh, cases. But uh, like any good round table, you should end with questions that you don't know the answers to and rely on your colleagues uh, and the audience to help fill you in. So with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, team. Uh, let's have Justin to have the final panel pres panelist presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me, um, everybody. And you might be wondering, what is somebody in, who studies state and local politics in the US doing on a panel, a comparative politics panel on on populism. Um, and so this is why I wanted everyone else to go first so I can um, I can conclude by talking a little bit about the one case I really know well, which is which is the US case. But um, maybe my my comments sort of problematize some of these discussions. And I think that one of the um, you know, if we think of the US case and we decide and we say, okay, where is democratic backsliding happening? who is leading this effort. It's really happening at the state and local level in American politics. I mean, it's been manifest at the national level with Trump. It's been, and we see the, some of the policy consequences of, uh, of right-wing populism at the national level, including the big tax cuts for wealthy folks and uh, uh, super restrictive immigration policies and so forth. Um, but sort of escaping close media scrutiny, escaping academic scrutiny is what's been happening at the state and local level. And I think, so we shouldn't feel too confident about the, that breaks have been, that the break has, the handbrake has been pulled on backsliding in, in the US just because Democrats have full control over the national government. And the way that this is sort of manifesting itself right now in, a, in, in American politics and has been over the past couple of years is to is with the Republican Party backing away from majoritarian type institutions and and majoritarian and democratic processes. And so I think Tim rightly points out the way in which the Democratic or the Republican Party, which has come to embody right wing populism really since since Trump, um, that uh, it is, it has relied on, it has managed to hold on to power in many respects because of sort of anti-majoritarian institutions, right? The Republican Party has lost the popular vote in seven of the previous eight presidential elections. The Republican Party has managed to maintain some control in Congress, often through the Senate, which overrepresents rural white people. They're definitely not a majoritarian legislative institution. At the state level and at the congressional level, Republicans have been able to maintain control uh, through processes of gerrymandering and carefully designing legislative districts, which insulate them from uh, from responsiveness and which makes them very hard to remove, hard to remove from power. And really, since Trump lost in November of 2020. Uh, Republicans have kind of continued to, at the state level, uh, and I should say that Republicans control most state governments in, in the U.S. If Democrats only control 18 state legislatures. Uh, so if we think about, you know, what, like what is happening right now, it's a continued attack on voting and other majoritarian in, institutions and, and, um, and democratic processes. So, for example, many state legislatures that are under Republican control right now are doing things to further make voting difficult. They're shortening this process of early voting, which was utilized very heavily in the 2020 presidential election. The state of Iowa is actually shortening, Republicans in Iowa are considering shortening the number of voting hours on election day itself. Um, and a lot of state Republican states are trying to make it more difficult to vote by mail. They're trying to constrain the ability of local elected officials to make voting easier by making these efforts, by attaching criminal penalties to such efforts. So this is all underway, despite the, room, the throwing Trump out of office and Democrats gaining control, gaining control of Congress. 
And what's really, and what's troubling is sort of the institutional checks that one might anticipate on these sort of processes um, are themselves weakening. So Republicans, another anti-democratic means that Republicans have relied on is the use of the judiciary. And this is why stacking the judiciary was so important for Donald Trump and Republicans in Congress while they had full control of government. And while we can draw some satisfaction from the fact that Trump appointed judges rejected his efforts to overturn the presidential election, they are allowing, there is the, the emergence in the US of a, of, a, of a legal doctrine that conservatives have liked for a long time called the independent state legislature doctrine, uh, which basically says that state legislatures are sort of solely responsible um, for setting state election rules. That is, uh, that maybe even state courts cannot become involved in these processes if state courts are for example, trying to uphold voting rights protections within the state constitution, there are many legal scholars and potentially a majority on the US Supreme Court that say only state legislatures can, um, can set election rules, not state courts, not other states, not other elected state uh, election officials at the local or county level. Um, and so what this means is that legislatures, Republican legislatures might have unfettered abilities to continue, uh, to continue backsliding. And this backsliding isn't happening just on at the, just with respect to you know, making voting easier or more difficult. Um, Republicans in some states are uh, trying to un undermine other democratic institutions, especially the institution of direct democracy and citizen initiative, which is one of the few which has been one of the few means in Republican dominated states for voters to pursue liberal policy change. So many states that allow direct democracy, for example, have raised the minimum wage over the objection of uh, Republican legislators or have passed democratic reforms to, for example, create a bipartisan process for drawing legislative districts. And right now in a number of states are trying to, Republican legislatures are trying to weaken institutions of direct democracy by, for example, requiring supermajority votes in order for voters to, to change existing laws or requiring um, almost impossible to meet signature thresholds in order for voters to qualify ballot measures. Um, and if we think about um, where is it that right-wing pop, what, what kind of party structures in the US has right-wing populism gained the greatest control? It's in state and local party structures. Um, it is not so much at the national level where Republicans, especially in the US Senate, seemed highly resistant to Trump's efforts to overturn the election. If you look at who was not resistant, it was state and local party organizations. Um, and Liz Cheney is an excellent example of this. So for those of you who don't know, she's the third ranking Republican in the US House of Representatives, a party leader there. Um, and the only party leader in the House of Representatives to um, vote in favor of Trump's impeachment and to be very critical of what Donald Trump did. Now, the Republicans in Congress agreed not to remove her from party leadership. But then if you go down, if you go and look at the party organization in her state of Wyoming, the Republican Central Committee voted 66 to 8 to censure her and to no longer support her um, as a member of their, of their party. Um, so that's where, uh, this is where right-wing populism in the U.S. has gained, it's gained its greatest foothold. Um, and so I would encourage people when they think about what's happening in, in the US case to, to, to not be stuck just looking at what's happening at the national level where the picture might look a little bit rosier, uh, but to look at what's happening at, at, the, state, at the state and local level. And um, there's a recent study that looks at, uh, you know, where has the most backsliding happened in the US? It's definitely at the state level and it's in states where Republicans have full control uh, have full control over government. And I think that, you know, the media pays less attention to what happens in state and local politics. And so a lot of this has gone um, sort of unnoticed or uh, noticed, but sort of ignored in favor of looking at what's happening at the national level in American politics. And this sort of 
taking over of state and local Republican Party organizations by uh, right-wing populists is very similar to something else that we observed in American politics, which is the taking over of, the Repu of state and local Republican Party organizations by social conservatives in the 1990s. Um, and you know, it didn't take long for them to sort of gain full control of, uh, of state and local party organizations. And then these organizations, obviously this has large downstream effects because they play key roles in, in nominating candidates uh, for higher level office. And so these are state and local Republican parties and state and local parties in the US in general are leading indicators uh, about what we might expect to observe in, in national politics. And I will, I will stop there. Thank you, Justin. Uh, so for everyone, uh, please write your questions in the Q&A and I will be making the questions to the panelists. Uh, and let me start, this has been a fantastic set of presentations. And something that uh, calls my attention is that there seems to be many roads to similar outcomes, right? So, um, uh, and, and these roads sometimes are so different that uh, there seems to be some other phenomena explaining uh, why people move in that direction. Uh, so Sherry tells us, I guess, the story of Western Europe, which is very similar to the story of Latin America. You had a very dramatic polarization in the 1930s and in the post in Western Europe and in the in the post-war era in Latin America. Polarization is not new to any of the two regions in the world. And in the period uh, uh, that Sherry discussed, polarization was good because it was limited. Uh, you know, the welfare state had limit uh, the stakes of what in the 1930s did not look so good. And same thing happens in the 90s in Latin America and the 80s and 90s. You know, we were not back to the military coups and guerrilla fight, but it was within democracy. And yet that convergence over time, uh, you know, as, as, the, as, the, as the two, you know, ends of the spectrum keeps approximating each other, especially, you know, as technocracy become more, uh, more important in policymaking, seem to have alienated the population. So the, the, the issue is that is what is alienated the population. In the US, the story that, that Justin tell us, and you know, we know there has been sorting of, of political party and party IDs, but we don't understand exactly what causes the sorting. You know, it might have been the polarization of the civil rights era, it might be something else. And then there are the cases which were not even that democratic to begin with, like Turkey, uh, Russia. I mean, uh, it's not so uh, surprising that in these cases, populist leaders of, or leaders that were popular, I don't know if I can call them populist, you know, take advantage of very brief periods of democracy to, to encroach uh, their power. Um, so my question, and I guess it's to all of you in a sense, is to think about what is that causes the followers to, to vote for these populist leaders, to believe, to make them uh, so popular, to polarize themselves. So there seems to be something on the demand side that's going on everywhere. And I, I don't exactly understand what it is. It cannot be just economic performance, as Tim argue, because, you know, in Turkey, Erdogan survived a very deep economic crisis, you know, these. So I, I would like to push you to think a little bit on the demand side. So what are voters thinking when they, you know, support these choices uh, and allow, say, the Republicans to take, you know, the state uh, governments and allow, you know, uh, populists to win uh, with different uh, arrangements across the world. So if you don't mind, uh, going, I guess, in the same order that you presented, and then I'll keep asking other questions from the audience. Bob? So, yes, uh, uh, Vicky, I think you've raised a, a really important point um, that, yes, let me just rephrase what you said. Yes, um, uh, when there's a default of representation in the party system, uh, that either opens the way for new extremist parties to emerge or um, uh, or for existing parties to kind of uh, act as entrepreneurs like in Hungary or Poland and 
and capture our kind of unrepresented uh, constituency. But that's the, the, that's the supply side. And I think that it is a mistake to ignore the demand side. Uh, that is to say that there are significant, you know, all of these populace played on cleavages that were very deep in some cases and, um, and, uh, and available. Now, you know, in the case of Latin America, um, Ken Roberts argues, I think, quite persuasively uh, that you, you know, you had this whole new cleavage emerging around, social cleavage emerging around neoliberal policies that were not adequately captured by the existing party system. But the cleavages were there. And so, you know, clever entrepreneurs were able to exploit them. Uh, I think the nature of the cleavage is going to vary. That clearly was uh, had economic components in Latin America, uh, much less, um, uh, in some cases, ethnic, but much less of ethnicity in most cases. Uh, much more questions of race and ethnicity and culture in, um, in Eastern Europe, uh, certainly much more in the one African case that we looked at uh, in Zambia. Uh, so, uh, but the main point is, I think, I'm not sure there's a single route if that's what you're looking for, but I think it's important not to ignore the demand side. Sorry. Thank you, Bob. So let me echo some of the things that Bob said. I mean, again, and you know, we can look at these things from both the demand and the supply side. And I think both of those perspectives are important. It's hard to understand something as complicated and complex as, you know, rising populism through just one lens or one variable. So, I mean, look, you know, from the demand side, one thing to think about is there really have been, particularly in Western societies, the ones that I study most, right? A huge number of shocks over the past couple of decades that have really created immense challenges for governments and people. I mean, there have been really powerful economic changes and really powerful social and cultural changes. I mean, we know all about these things, you know, sort of rising inequality um, in the United States, diminishing social mobility, increased cleavages between rural and urban areas on the social level, all Western countries, not, not just the United States have become much more diverse. And by diverse, I mean, not only high levels of immigration, but obviously the mobilization of minority groups that had hitherto existed, but had not played, you know, fully been participating in the political system. Um, you know, the erosion, quote unquote, of traditional or religious values. I mean, these are things that I think have created a lot of discomfort for a lot of people and you know we're sort of there to be um, tapped into by the right whatever you want to call them political entrepreneurs and parties right so I think on the demand side right you know we have this bubbling dissatisfaction and the supply side is you know a question of what happens to those things right are they captured by mainstream democratic small d democratic parties right or are these concerns not sufficiently well addressed, thereby leaving a space for more radical populist politicians and parties to address, right? And so I think both of those things are going on. I mean, I think it's also very hard for anyone who's lived through the last four years of Donald Trump to deny the fact that, you know, elites have an incredibly powerful agenda setting, um, you know, can have an incredibly powerful agenda setting function. I mean, all of these, it's not so much that people's, I think, predilections or preferences change. It's what's considered to be part of the, you know, political competition process. Um, you know, racism existed before Donald Trump. Xenophobia existed before Donald Trump. There's very little evidence that it has dramatically increased over the past years, but it is becoming much more salient part of our political discourse and our political life. I mean, largely, I would say, because of the right, but also because um, it's these kinds of issues have been increasingly stressed by um, you know folks on the left. Now there are many good reasons for that, right? There are a whole variety of issues that American and European and other societies need to deal with, right? But the increasing salience of cultural and social issues creates a whole variety of very difficult dynamics for democracy. Because as I sort of um, you know pointed to in my discussion of Western Europe, I think these issues are much more difficult for democracy to deal with than. 
economic issues, right? You know, polarizing around, you know, how much should we spend on the welfare state? Should we have free trade or more protectionism? Should the state be more or less regulatory? I mean, you know, these can be pretty, you know, polarizing issues, but they're not the kind of zero sum identity based issues that you see when you're talking about some of these social and cultural things. And I think, you know, the more these issues come to dominate our political discourse and debate, the more likely we are to have, you know, much more serious problems with polarization and partisanship. So I think looking at the interaction between the demand and the supply side is really important for understanding, you know, what's been going on, um, you know, across the globe with populism and democratic decay. Thank you, Sherry. Tim? Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that there are many paths to the same outcome. Uh, in, in my remarks, I wanted to uh, uh, try to um, cut through the kind of multiple channels and the difficult uh, causal factors that we, you know, we might identify you know, by thinking about kind of what is, some, in some of these cases, we do see these exogenous shocks that really uh, increase political people's li living standards that allow them to, um, uh, you know, that allow the executive to really um, aggrandize their own power. And in that way, the, you know, the, the demand side story is pretty obvious. That's not the, the, the hard one to explain. Um, I think Bob is right about the um, ability of uh, executives in these cases to offer a set of, uh, of policies and play off different cleavages in response to, you know, changes in uh, uh, the international, uh, you know, environment where, um, you know, we see uh, Orban, who had been previously been a liberal, turns himself into a populist. You know, Putin's base in, in his first decade in power is a very different one from uh, his second uh, 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 his second time in power. So even as Sherry notes that you know preferences might not change, but the ability of executives to manipulate the uh, uh, policies on offer, you know, can allow them to uh, um, uh, keep their uh, uh, power. Um, there's also. Um, uh, Another thing I've noticed is, um, you know, after 2008, 2009, the financial crisis, the crisis over the European Union, um, allows some of these kind of populist leaders to credibly claim that, um, you know, maybe democracy isn't so great. You know, one of the things that Orban and Erdogan and Putin and Chavez all point to every time there's failings uh, uh, in, in the United States, um, or in Europe is to say, you want democracy? Well, you know, this is what it looks like, racial and ethnic strife, uh, economic collapse, um, uh, and all of the other kind of, uh, you know, factors that, uh, you know, we're all, you know, concerned about and that, you know, confront us in our uh, uh, political lives. And, you know, I do think there is this kind of second order uh, effect that, uh, you know, making the case for democracy in a lot of these countries is, is uh, m much different after uh, uh, 2008, 2009 than it was in the 1990s when there was this, you know, a much easier, democracy was a much easier sell uh, within these countries um, uh, as, you know, opposition parties wanted to, uh, you know, try to, to obtain power. Um, so we also need to think about how uh, the notion of democracy has changed over time and whether or not, you know, that's really an attractive uh, uh, selling point. Thank you, Team Justin. I mean, this is a great question, Vicki, and I think almost impossible to answer. <laughs> uh, but hopefully this spurs a, a, a big research agenda to sort of understand or a, to further understand what um, what what happened? Uh, because in 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 the U.S. case, I mean, I think that the major dividing lines are along this kind of cultural dimension: issues about race, immigration, abortion, which creates kind of an us versus them politics, in which uh, people who take these socially conservative positions feel sort of attacked by those who don't and threatened by those who don't. And so, the best kind of leader is someone who's going to like. You know, you want to. They want a leader who's going to stand up for them and really fight for them. And who's best to do that than a leader who's willing to break the rules? 
Uh, it's a great way to show that you're willing to fight for people. But I think that as part of part of a developing a deeper understanding of what happened in, in the US case, I mean, hopefully I'm working on a project that can speak to these issues because I've been working for several years with Gerald Gamm at University of Rochester collecting historic state party platforms so we can kind of try and understand when and, and how these culture issues begin to become partisan in, in American politics. And I think one of the things that you see in this early phase, we've done actually quite a bit of archival work too, which is something very new for me, uh, is that there was um, a demand for these kind of policies and politicians were very not willing to supply them. Um, and politicians wanted to avoid, in the US case, wanted to avoid these kind of culture war issues because they thought it would be alienating. Um, you'd immediately turn off half of your constituents and so they would rather talk about economic issues. But eventually the demand from the voting public and pressure from party activists gets too great. And I think this begins the process in the US of parties polarizing on these issues. And in the American case, it's a slow, all of our data suggests it's a very slow multi-decade long process. It's not, there's no kind of triggering event per se, but rather, um, you know, it this kind of polarization incre incrementally develops over time. But that's the only, I, there's not a great answer, but hopefully there will, we'll have better answers as a field and these kind of conversations and conferences, I think, facilitate the development of those answers. Yeah, I mean, and let me take one more before getting to the questions, but I think it's interesting in both you and Sherry mentioned these kind of moral issues. And uh, I think Delia Baldassari and others have made the argument that not all moral issues pick up, at least the data for the United States suggests that on gay and, 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 and women attitudes towards women, in fact, what you see is the Republicans moving slower than the Democrats, right? Mm -hmm. but eventually coming together. So the gap is not a real gap in the election of when, you know, when we're Bush election in 2004, gay marriage was very big, in big and polarizing. Now gay marriage is not polarizing anymore. So certainly there might be something with those issues that, you know, if we take this temporal view, uh, makes it different. And yet other issues like abortion or even environmental issues that, that were not partisan in the 1970s have become deeply polarizing. I think the environment is now more polarizing than any other issue for the US. So certainly there's something going on. And, and you know, there, the kind of, uh, there's a lot of arguments in, in shared response, but it seems that most of those come back to this issue of globalization, to our reaction to trade integration, to a reaction to technology, the impact of technology on the economy, you know, the cost that that brought that make people move around more, make people more afraid of the risk of, of, of losing their job. Uh, on the one hand, and on the supply side, I mean, and, and uh, when Sherry was talking, I was thinking about Borgen, uh, the series, you know, the fact that there's no more uh, working class labor leaders and that the right wing leaders are very kind of cosmopolitan uh, in the convergence. So there seems to be uh, also a reaction to a kind of university created technocracy, right? That make people more homogeneous on both sides. So those two things seem to be happening uh, a little bit everywhere in terms of, you know, even if you think of the, of the neoliberal era in Latin America, there was a kind of a Washington consensus that both you know, lead, you know, a lot of technocrats on, on every side seem to agree. So this idea that elites know what's better and especially educated elites that were educated together uh, seems to have uh, a lot of purchasing power along with the traditional arguments about the cost of techno you know, technological change and, and globalization. And those seem to cut across. I don't think they explain everything. In particular, they don't explain race so well, I mean, despite migration as being one, but those seem to be going uh, across all of your cases. I don't know if I'm, uh, you know, just a hypothesis there. Any thoughts or are we uh, open to? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm, I think that it's a useful, very useful to talk about the dislocations of, of globalization. I think that's unmistakable and that's, Kind of accelerated and new and 
compounded by the shocks that Jerry that Jerry uh, mentioned. But uh, I, I don't think we've really talked enough about the role of the internet and sort of how that and disinformation and how that has uh, fed this process as well. And you know, yes, there were certainly episodes of polarization before the internet. Uh, you know, the, the, some of this is not new. But I'm just struck by how extraordinary it is. Uh, this is not most political, you know, I haven't studied this. But I think it's extraordinary the extent to which um, the, you know, the social media has been uh, manipulated um, and also uh, pillarized, you know, in separate uh, pillars that really structure how people see the reality. And I mean, if you think about the United States right now, it's interpreted, you know, popular interpretation of the election. And here you have uh, an assault on the Capitol with people carrying Trump flags and people carrying Confederate flags and people shouting, hang Mike Pence uh, and looking to kill Nancy Pelosi. And yet you have, you know, a whole group of Republican leaders and followers who are saying, don't believe your lying eyes, you know, that this was, these were Antifa, uh, it wasn't really so bad, uh, all sorts of ways in which the narrative gets reconstructed. Now, uh, I, you know, I don't know exactly how that feeds into polarization or to all this. I think it needs to be much more systematically um, explored, but I mean, there is a cultural, I think, you know, impressionistically at least, that there's a cultural change uh, that um, kind of facilitates uh, a lot of the rest of what we've been talking about. Can, can I uh, respond to, to that? There's a, so one of the, I mean, I agree, agree with Bob, uh, and I'm never quite sure how to interpret the data about, you know, do people believe that, um, uh, you know, Trump was actually behind the insurrection or that, you know, th that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, people, you know, denying, you know, what seems to be completely obvious. We have video, you know, uh, Proof, if we want to want, want to call it, um, how much of that is you know people's sincere belief, and how much of that is people signaling their commitment to what they see as uh, you know the party. You know, I think we get you know we, Hugo Mercier has this nice book where he talks about um, you know people behave, behave, people behaving as if they believed what they believed, um, which we don't see as often as people saying they believe things um, that seem to, you know, defy, uh, uh, defy logic. And one of the reasons they may be saying things that seem to, you know, defy reality is really to signal, you know, their commitment that they're a real true uh, follower of Donald Trump, and that they're even willing to say things that uh, uh, seem to be uh, seem to be incredible, and that they're often, you know, not willing to act on those beliefs. You know, people who say their votes were stolen, but then they don't take action, you know, uh, uh, upon that. So if you know, forty percent of Republicans say they think their vote was stolen, I'm just picking a number out of the air. You know, we don't see 40% of Republicans, you know, protesting in the street. So, you know, I, I, I've always struggled to try to understand how much of, uh, you know, the responses are, uh, you know, driven by things other than, um, you know, what, what we see as reality. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, it's kind of an abstract answer. But. Sure. Anyone else, or shall I go to the questions from the audience? Any thoughts on this? No? Okay. Let me get some of the questions and get it back to you. Um, okay. The first question is, what is the role of state bureaucracy in promoting and sustaining or else sabotaging populism, particularly in Latin America, but beyond that, if you wish? 
any ideas, are ideas like the classic O'Donnell's bureaucratic authoritarianism still valid in Latin America today to explain the combination of technocracy and elite culture within, within a relatively capable bureaucracy apparatus like that of Brazil's, for instance. Um, that was by Bruno Cunha. And then Amy Erica Smith has written, we have had a lot of discussion over the past several panels on polarization and its role in populism. Might the relationship between polarization and populism depend on the level of analysis, for instance, polarization at the mass level versus at the level of the party activists versus at the level of the national elected leaders? And let me get a third one and get back to you and then we'll do the rest. Question for Justin. I was curious about how those cultural and moral issues vary across generations in the US. Any hope mm -hmm. that time would make things better? So let me get it back to you. In which, who wants to take? Justin, do you wanna start with Virginia's question? Sure, sure, I'm, I'm happy to take that question. Um, I, I, I think that the, uh, yes, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm optimistic that some of these cultural issues um, will become less salient in American politics as, as you know, as the population becomes more racially and ethnically diverse and as some older voters, I guess, as we like to say, exit the voting population. <laughs> um, so there's so there's hope. And I think this is part of why the strategy for uh, for right wing populism in the US is to limit democratic participation and in institutions, because there's a sense that this it's like the only remaining the only remaining strategy, which suggests that they also have this view of the future. Um, but I would I would like to say that even some issues that seem like they have lost some of their bite in in the American culture wars, like LGBT rights. I mean, there was just a bill that passed the U.S. House of Representatives yesterday to add sexual orientation and gender identity to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It received two Republican votes, two. So if we say is are LGBTQ rights still polarizing in American politics, I would say yes. And, and the reason given for this is not that they, of course, dislike LGBTQ people, but rather that this is a threat to religion. And this idea that there are threats to the practice of religion in the US is very mobilizing for people. Mm -hmm. Anyone else on the other questions, Bob, uh, on the Latin American question? Uh, uh... So um, I, I think that the, I mean, the, from the, the perspective that I look at that, at, at this, the real issue is whether populists are in a position to get their loyalists uh, into key positions within the, within the bureaucracy. Uh, not so much the bureaucracy, kind of a deep state that fosters the, the, the uh, takeover, it's the reverse in some ways. Um, uh, in Latin America, of course, there's a long tradition and nothing new about this where, you know, political leaders are able to kind of get their people into, into, the, into the judiciary, into um, uh, key agencies within, within, the, within the, the bureaucracy and so forth. And, um, uh, but I think this has gone very far in the cases that we look at. And that, well, you know, particularly the judiciary, if you can get control of the judiciary, and particularly if you can get control of the uh, prosecutorial apparatus, um, and this is, you know, it doesn't happen everywhere to the same extent, but it happens a lot. And of course, if you could get your people into those kinds of institutions, that gives you tremendous leverage over a lot of other things, over the press, over the private sector. Um, over civil liberties and, and of course over the electoral um, uh, system. So um, I, I may not have understood that first question uh, and I, therefore I may not have answered it on target, but that's at least that's the way I see the relationship between these kinds of autocratic figures and, and the, the bureaucracy. Okay, anyone wants to take uh, Amy Erica Smith question on polarization? Um, 
Remember, everyone who has questions, you can write in the Q&A. So Amy, nobody took on the relationship between polarization and populism and the idea that it might be at different levels of analysis. I, I can throw, I mean, I, I'm not, I, I don't have a, a good answer to Amy's question, but I will throw out, you know, some interesting um, empirics, right, that I mentioned briefly in my, um, in my comments, which is, you know, if you look at elites in, Western Europe, that is to say the folks who run, represent whatever mainstream parties in Western Europe. And from that, I mean everything from Greens through Social Democratic parties through Christian Democratic parties. You know, if you look at survey data, their attitudes have become much more compressed um, over the past decades. Um, the opposite has happened in the United States where Republican and um, Democratic elites have become much more polarized and again, particularly on cultural issues. Um, so again, I mean, I, I think that that, you know, it, it, it just sort of brings up the fact that this is, you know, these are sort of complicated dynamics, um, you know, and so I think you have to look at these different levels. I mean, one debate that's been very big in the American literature, much bigger for reasons I'm not quite sure of is um, that in the um, European literature is, you know, what's driving what, right? Is the polarization being driven by, you know, is elite polarization what happened first and that's driving the mass polarization, you know, among average voters or are these things together or is voter polarization, you know, really the most important thing? I mean, you know, this, this is a much more lively debate in American politics than it is in um, European politics. But I will say that if you look at the data on what's happened to elites, it's, it's not the same in, Europe and the United States. I mean, in my understanding in the US and, and you know, Justin is the expert here is that, you know, the most dramatic shifts have actually happened on the left with, um, you know, sort of left wing elites becoming significantly more left wing over the past couple of decades than any other, you know, sort of particular group. That's neither good nor bad. It's just, you know, sort of what's what's been going on. And so thinking, tracing out, you know, sort of these different trends and what they, you know, sort of how they may interact with other trends, um, you know, is something that you know I think could be could be very effectively done in a comparative perspective. Tim, do you want to add something? Thank yeah, I Sherry. just yeah, I mean, I was going to add on uh, the question on the bureaucracy, and you know, obviously in Poland and Hungary, this is you know the critical issue where even EU conditionality, which most people thought would be the guarantor. Uh, against democratic backsliding, um, you know, Hungary and Poland have still been able to, uh, you know, subvert the judiciary in ways that, uh, you know, even EU conditionality has not been able to stop. So, you know, we can look at these cases as, um, you, know, individ you know, individual cases without the external influence and think of all the advantages that you know, elected officials have to put their own cronies in office. Um, uh, but even in cases where there's that additional backstop of the EU and all the funds that they're uh, you know, lavishing on Poland and Hungary, even with that tool, um, they've really been, you know, they've been able to slow some of the backsliding maybe, um, but not certainly not prevent it. So it's a much more the difficult you know, problem um, at least the Hungary and Poland cases suggest that it's a much more difficult uh, uh, problem than, uh, you know, than we would have thought of, you know, five years ago. Thank you, Tim. We have a question from Ernesto Calvo, who I think can go to all of you. <laughs> for many years, inequality was used as an argument for an increase in the likelihood of democratization. Now it is also used to explain, uh, it used to explain or describe democratic recession. Can we have the same mechanism for populism? Are we using the satisfaction for processes that seem to go in very different directions? Anybody wants to take it? Yeah, great. I guess, uh, Bob, you have written on democracy yeah, and inequality. No, I, think I, I need to answer that, or at least to respond. Uh, <laughs> uh, bottom line, I mean, it depends on what you mean by inequality. Right, but if, you, if bottom line, if you're simply, if you have a very simplistic idea of sort of income distribution, uh, you know, gaps between the rich and poor, I, I really don't think that explains very much either way. Uh, 
uh, which is what I, I'm on record as saying. Um, I think it's much, much more complicated than that. And I don't, I haven't really um, been able to get my head completely around what the complications are. First of all, I think that uh, if inequality matters, it's inequality plus something else. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what that is. Inequality plus a recession or uh, inequality plus some other kind of shock. Uh, uh, that may matter. Uh, the second uh, point I would make, and I, you know, I don't want to kind of, I don't want to go on and on, but the second point I would make is that um, there is some sort of link politically, I think, between inequality and a sense of unfairness. And it's not quite clear when people believe that this is unfair. And it's not quite clear who believes it's unfair. I mean, what we see, we had a session on uh, a few weeks ago uh, on, and which the um, observation about the Chilean protest with the comes uh, not from the poorest people, but from uh, the people who have uh, kind of clawed into the middle class and but see themselves blocked. It's a kind of typical Albert Hirschman. You know, I think of Albert Hirschman as the tunnel effect. You know, if you're stuck in the tunnel and you see the other lane moving, uh, you may be happy at first because you think your turn will come. Uh, but then as, you're, as you continue to be stalled, you get angrier and angrier. Uh, so I don't know whether this is a general, uh, something general or not, but the point I'm trying to make is that, um, Ernesto, to your question, I, I don't think inequality by itself tells you very much. And the, there, there has to be much more kind of layered into an explanation before you get to a political outcome. Any other one on this issue of inequality? Well, Sorry. I have to say I've never really found the arguments that inequality caused democratization particularly convincing. I'm not really sure I fully bought the mechanisms that were making those connections. Um, I mean, there's simply no doubt that there's been rising inequality in many parts of the Western world. I mean, it's diminished in parts of the developing world and it's diminished between the developing and the developed world, but the levels of rising inequality in, um, you know, the United States in particular and the downstream consequences that that, that has had, you know, it's, it's association with diminishing social mobility, it's, um, it's deepening of geographical cleavages. It seems to me that, that it, is, it is really very hard for me to imagine how those things cannot be reflected. Those things are not reflected in the political problems that we have today. And I know Americanists focus very much more than Europeanists do, again, for interesting reasons on social and cultural factors. Um, but I think those are often, to my mind, seem to me the last part in a causal chain. I mean, it seems to me very counterintuitive to think that rising inequality, again, combined with diminishing social mobility and increased geographical divisions does not exacerbate or make it easy to increase the salience of all kinds of social and cultural resentments. I, I just, I can't understand how we can tell the story of rising populism and democratic dissatisfaction without looking at those things. Although as I'm perfectly willing to say that looking at those things alone is not sufficient as on the micro level, there is very little strong connection between those variables and for instance, voting patterns or political preferences. But to not see that at the macro level as being an important background factor strikes me as going against common sense, frankly. Thank you, Sherry. Anyone else or shall we move to the next question, Tim? Yeah, just a couple quick points. One is uh, to go back to the Russia case, we saw poverty, in, in, you know, inequality and poverty, you know, fell during this boom period from 1998 to 2008 when, you know, we, we saw, uh, you know, the great aggrandizement uh, of power in, uh, so in some of these cases that are driven by, um, you know, uh, natural resource booms, we might see poverty fall, uh, might see inequality fall, um, but still get some of the, the outcomes that, that, that I described before. Um, also, I want to second Bob's point about uh, you know, inequality um, uh, plus in the part that you know, we need to 
think about the, the, the context in which people's economic interests play out. Because Justin, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the, it's the relatively well off um, uh, without a college degree uh, who are white, who are kind of the most loyal Trump voters. It's the car dealer in the small, you know, middle-sized town uh, uh, somewhere who is, you know, really the, the kind of core group uh, 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 driving uh, uh, some of this. So this is not the, the classic, you know, Meltzer Richards model of, you know, you know, the, 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 the poor and the elites mapping their economic situation directly onto their political preferences. But when you unpack it a little bit and put some context around it, we might be able to trace out the effects of these economic factors a little bit more uh, precise. Thank you, Justin. Do you want to respond to Tim? Well, I mean, I, I think that it's yeah, I, I think there's not a good answer because I do I, I you know, I guess I lean more towards the cultural dimension that there are a lot of cultural grievances that have been fostered and then politically mobilized. And I don't know the extent to which those are connected to, to economics. I think the research in American politics, which has tried to, you know, understand the Trump voter has found that a lot of, a lot of Trump voters are actually quite well off financially, right? And that they seem to be motivated more by these, by these cultural issues. And these cultural issues that seem to be the biggest weapon for Trump. Uh, in his in his campaign, and maybe his moving away from them into sort of more obscure issues in 2020 helps explain his helps explain his defeat. So I, I you know I, I think that economic inequality plays plays a role, but it's interesting to think about the connection between between economic inequality and, and cultural issues, and whether inequality sort of helps foster the relevance of cultural issues or the or cultural issues relevant. I, I don't know what the what the right causal chain is. Thank you. Um, there is a question uh, for Sherry from Beatrice Bonini. Uh, with reference to the rise of populist parties, both new and already existing in Western Europe and the role of social media in this context. Do you think that social media played a role in allowing politicians, parties in gathering information on the demand side? For instance, people's sentiment on cultural and economic dimensions that were previously latent. And then do you think they use this kind of information to pander to their preferences, reveal signals through people's social media activity? Or do you think the mechanism and story is a different one? Um, thank you for that question. Um, I, I would say from what I, my understanding is it's not so much that populist politicians and parties were able to sort of gather new information from social media that enabled them to, for instance, target their appeals more effectively. There seems to be a couple of other things going on. I mean, one is populist parties in Europe, um, Western Europe in particular, tend to be really quite good at social media, often better than traditional parties, partially because they lack the traditional mechanisms of outreach that longer standing traditional parties had had. And so they therefore jumped on the opportunities that social media offered to be able to both connect with and mobilize their supporters. So I think, you know, they've made very good use of social media. And then, you know, the sort of other big factor, which of course people talk a lot about in the United States is just, you know, the ability to disseminate information, especially, you know, sort of fake news, which is, you know, is it's not something new, right? It's not something that hasn't existed in political campaigns or political life before, but it can spread much more rapidly via social media than it can through more traditional um, means. So, I mean, I think what social media has done, right, is kind of, you know, provided a, maybe what you might think of as an accelerant to a lot of the, you know, sort of trends that, you um, you know, we've seen, um, you know, giving new parties opportunities for outreach and mobilization that they might not have had in a previous era, allowing, again, populists and others to spread information often of a, you know, um, fake or nefarious sort and all of these kinds of things can very easily benefit, you know, populist, populist parties, politicians, um, 
autocrats and so on. Um, but there's no doubt that in Western Europe in particular, as I started by saying that these parties have been better in general, right, than, than a lot of their more traditional counterparts in using social media for political purposes. We have a question by Juan Pablo Luna. Uh, a thin definition of populism by default accommodates most of what we're seeing around the world. European nativism and Latin American populism are covered by such a definition. But for that same reason, it becomes analytically problematic. What else would you say is a minimum common denominator of what we are trying to describe makes sense across regions and cases? besides aesthetic similarities in mobilization strategy and types of issues that eventually become convenient for aspiring leaders to prime to get an electoral edge. Who wants to take this one? Um, I, I'm not sure, Juan Pablo, with all due respect, I'm not sure I understand what the issue is. Um, um, I, I think that the Moody, you know, this sort of notion of a, uh, Populism as a thin ideology is a very useful one because it, uh, it, it provides a kind of an underlying cognitive map of, of, the, of conflict. Uh, sort of what goes into that map, you know, the content uh, will vary across regions. Uh, but I, 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 I buy. Uh, pretty much, the, and this was, by the way, I think that Ken Roberts and Kurt Whalen and others well before Moody started talking about this were saying very similar things uh, about uh, Latin American populism. So, um, so um, I think that's a pretty, I think that's one area that uh, it seems pretty reasonable point of departure for trying to understand um, sort of the, the uh, underlying kind of basis of comparison for populism as well. Anyone else? I mean, and the point I think, Bob, though, uh, if I have a two finger on, on Juan Pablo, is that the relationship between populism and democratic backsliding is harder to understand with such a thin definition. Because not all the cases of populism, you know, when I mean, you could take a kind of Nadia Urbinati definition of populism being a, democ a form of democracy, right? Um, so not all of these cases of populism lead to backsliding. Maybe it's because there are different phenomena, there are different types, if you want, or subtypes, and only some of them uh, will lead to backsliding. And by having such a thin definition where you have basically a Nazi party and a party that promotes gay mar mar marriage, abortion, and I don't know, I mean, very different ideologies uh, and very different contexts. You do not know when, for instance, populism really represents a challenge to democracy. Um, so I think that's a limitation that the definition has. Do you want me to respond to that? Or? Sure. So I think the fundamental distinction between po is, is between populism and pluralism. And I think that there's a fundamentally, a fundamental difference between a conception of society as one in which there are shifting majorities around um, changing issues, uh, and one in which there is a fixed and permanent conflict between uh, the people and, you know, the the corrupt elite, and uh, I, I, I think that's uh, that has un inherently undemocratic and un because uh, components because it's um, it, it rejects kind of a more pluralist conception of society. Now, um, uh, context is important, so that um, there are times in which kind of populist themes can play out in a fundamentally democratic context, uh, and which it might actually do some good. I mean, I'm a, I like Bernie Sanders. I would never vote for him. Uh, but I, I, uh, I think he plays a very positive role in American politics. Uh, but that's because, uh, to the extent that it's positive, it's because there's a kind of a, it's embedded in a set of institutions and processes which are not populist. 
Uh, and so I think that the, the, when populism is a, becomes a serious threat is when populists gain power. And um, it becomes an especially serious threat if they gain control of the legislature. That's my story, and I want to stick to it. Yeah, uh, let, let me do a follow-up that's really more to Justin. Bernie Sanders is a good example if you compare to Donald Trump. So the story that Justin told us is a story of a minoritarian populism that wants to restrict the vote. If there's something that we know about pop, you know, Bernie Sanders and that branch of populism is they want to enlarge enfranchisement. So the relationship to democracy of those two types of American populism are significantly different. By having the same definition for both of them, we cannot understand you know, the relationship between the populism and democracy. I don't know, Justin, you know more about American politics than any of us, but. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting because it's not, I think both of them, I mean, from right-wing populism in the U.S. thinks it can only win by restricting the franchise and left-wing populism presumably thinks it wins by expanding the franchise and by expanding the electorate. Um, and so I don't know that these are totally principled positions <laughs> um, on, on either side, but rather sort of strategies. Um, and so I don't know how, you know, it's, it's a great, I think it's a really interesting question because in the lead up to this panel, which I guess the viewers weren't privy to, there was an email exchange or just about the definition of the definition of populism. And some people, you know, a colleague of ours saying, oh, how can there really be right-wing populism? What is that even? Um, so it's, I think it's, it's, it's interesting, but defining the terms would sort of help me <laughs> uh, because I, you know, I know the U.S. case really well and I can think of various populist leaders throughout time, but I don't know the, the comparative cases nearly as well, though I've learned uh, a great deal even just here. And so I think, you know, definitional clarity would be, would be nice, but that's a really interesting point, Vicky, about the sort of different approaches to participation from left-wing and right-wing populism right now in the U.S. I mean, I, I, can I jump in? Just, yes, sure. I mean, you know, one point that Danny Roderick makes, um, and it's it's a gross simplification, but it gets to I think um, Pablo Luna's point is that you know we might think that there are different causes of right wing populism and left wing populism, and he makes the kind of uh, uh, you know uh, simplifying argument that you know the right wing populism tends to focus more on cultural. Uh, grievances and issues and the left-wing populism, you know, economics tends to play um, a, a bigger role. So that's a different way to, you know, conceive of populism rather than thinking this is, you know, there's one big tent and we can unpack, you know, why we see backsliding in some cases rather than others. But I have a question for Justin, which is related, which is, um, why do you think the Republicans, um, prefer to try to restrict the franchise rather than find policies uh, that might be more popular. Um, you know, I mean, there, there are different ways to respond to the threat of losing elections. Uh, is, yes. yeah, I don't I, to put you on the spot, but I think, I, I think that's a, that's a. No, I think it's a, it's, you know, I, I think it's, it gets to the root of what is the motivating force of right-wing populism in the U.S. right now. It's an us versus them. Mm -hmm. And to, to um, win, from their perspective, I think, to win popular majorities, they would have to somehow welcome in the them mm -hmm. um, into this us group. And they're not willing to do that. And so therefore, you just try and make it really difficult for this this other group to to participate, and I mean everything I read right now about you know state legislatures are yes. back in session. It's like all about hundreds of bills to 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 limit voting um, in in some capacity. So this is this is the strategy, and they're hoping to be aided and abetted by this packed judiciary full of conservatives. Okay, let me go back to the questions. 
Uh, I want to read both questions and then give all the panelists the opportunity to end uh, because we have 10 minutes uh, left only. So we have a question by Daniel, by Daniel Markovic, and he says, as a couple of panelists mentioned there, as a couple of panelists mentioned, there is a debate about to what extent populism is inherently at war with democracy. In the US, and at least a couple of other cases, anti-democratic maneuvers are publicly justified in the language of democracy and public support for democracy remains high in surveys. Do you think incumbent party elites are explicitly seeking to destroy democracy or are they fueling backsliding as an incidental effect of their pursuing of short-term partisan goals? So that's the question. And there is another question by Eduardo Moncada to anyone in the panel, all, all of you. Could you speak to the formal and informal ties between right-wing populist parties across national boundaries, such as between those in Europe and the United States, what are the points of convergence and divergence and their collective aims? So let's have, um, you know, back to the panelists for like two minutes and a half each, more or less. Who wants to go first? Bob, I'm going to ask you since you started. <laughs> How come I always have to go first? <laughs> because we trust you. <laughs> Um, look, they were, these are great questions, and I, I'm not sure I can really um, respond very well. I, again, I, I mean, I think that there are certain contexts in which populism uh, can um, be positive, uh, particularly in a role of kind of oppositional and gadfly roles. Um, they can push the political system into, mo into more progressive, socially just left wing populism can do that, at least. But um, I think populists in power are really a very different story, whether they're left or right. And uh, uh, again, I just would insist that, um, you know, the, the counterpart to populism is, is pluralism. And when left wing populists, as we've seen in Latin America, or right wing populists, as we see in much of Europe, uh, get into power, they pose a tremendous danger. Uh, to uh, to democracy, and um, certainly uh, yes, uh, you can make an argument that the uh, the systems that were overthrown uh, by uh, Chavez or 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 uh, Morales or Correa were corrupt and ineffective and unrepresentative. I wouldn't argue against that. Uh, but the replacement was not a, were not democracies. The replacement were some kind of autocracy. And uh, I think that's what happened when you have people with worldviews that, you know, there's a permanent majority that they have, uh, represent uh, when people like that get into uh, power. So as far as a quick sentence on the, the uh, transnational, uh, I think this is a very important question. And um, uh, we see kind of that you know, there are certainly, at least with, between Europe and the United States, a lot of sort of back and forth. I don't know, but I leave it to others to talk about what the, um, what the, uh, what the impact of that is overall. Thank you, Bob. Sherry, maybe you go next in the order we, you presented. Um, I'll take Daniel's question. Um, I think. Part of the difficulty of answering this question, it's a very good one, is that, you know, there's lots of different understandings of what democracy means out there. You know, populists very much in Western Europe, and I would say to some degree in the United States, right, if we consider Trump's Republican Party in that category, right, you know, they have a very particular understanding of what democracy is, you know, despite the fact that, you know, as, as Justin's pointed out, this is an anti-majoritarian policy party in some ways, you know, it's very much a kind of, you know, straightforward definition of democracy. We win elections, we get to do, you know, sort of what we want. I mean, the rhetoric is very much about, you know, elites and them having, you know, sort of stolen from us, you know, whatever it is, our government, our, you know, our rights, yada, yada, yada. So the, 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 the rhetoric is democratic, but it's a very thin and particular version of democracy. So, I mean, you know, how committed are these folks to democracy in places where democracy is relatively long lived, like the United States and Western Europe? 
you know, I mean, again, it, it really depends on what you mean by democracy. We've obviously seen democratic backsliding in these in places where democracy was quite weak, you know, in places like Europe, Turkey, you know, Russia, which which, you know, Tim has discussed where these are not really democratic countries anymore. So the commitment to democracy there was, you know, not even superficial. It was really, you know, just kind of rhetorical um, in so far as it existed at all. Um, I don't think that folks, you know, populists in Western Europe think of themselves as having this nefarious you know, um, plan to undermine democracy. I do think, though, that they think that the systems are not particularly democratic given their definitions. But I think those are not definitions that we would agree with. They're not, to use Bob's terms, pluralist definitions of democracy or liberal definitions of democracy. I also want to echo, though, something else Bob said, which is I think it's very important to distinguish between the grievances that populists feed off and the solution to those grievances that they offer. I think populism, as I mentioned in my comments, very much should be seen as a sign, a reflection, as a symptom of the fact that lots of people are very dissatisfied, that they have grievances that they feel are not being addressed. Now, you know, however much we may dislike the way they think those grievances should be addressed and certainly solutions populists offer to them, democracy cannot survive when 40% of the population thinks Donald Trump is, you know, a reasonable president. Right, something needs to be done about that. Now, some of those people are racists and xenophobes. I personally don't believe they all are, but I think some significant percentage of them don't care about small d democracy enough to prioritize it. They're willing to accept Trump because they think whatever, he's gonna give them jobs, he's gonna defend them, yada, yada, yada. And the other things that he does that are illiberal, anti-pluralist and even anti-democratic, they don't care very much about it. It's not that they are particularly you know, motivated by racism or xenophobia, they just don't care about those things very much. I think this highlights for us as a society that we have, again, 40% of the people who have a very problematic relationship to small d democracy. And I think if we don't address that in some way, um, we are going to have a lot of trouble going forward. We can't simply dismiss these people and hope that we're going to, you know, win elections and keep them out of power. Um, because even if we could do that as big d Democrats, that's really no way to um, have a thriving, health, healthy society or democracy. So it's a warning call for us, that is to say us as small d Democrats that we need to take very seriously. Yeah, thanks. Like, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So on the, the, the relationship between democratic values and society and the outcomes for democracy, it depends a lot on uh, you know, what we, what we wanna call democracy and you know if you know senator mike lee says we're a republic not a democracy that, that that's not particularly reassuring um when the 2016 election when uh obama pelosi schumer ryan and mcconnell uh discussed whether or not they should release information about uh, what the Russians were up to during the election, you know, five of the six members of that group wanted to release a statement saying, you know, that they were very concerned about things that the Russians were doing, and you know, McConnell uh, opposed it, uh, despite you know lots of support for uh, uh, mass support for democracy. In the case I know best. Um, you know, elites have a lot of ability to define what we mean by democracy. As political scientists, we're really concerned about procedure. Um, but I think uh, in the mass, people are much less concerned um, about procedure and more concerned uh, about outcomes. And even in Russia, if you ask people, um, do you think your leader should be elected in free and fair elections? 80% plus we support. You know, do you think freedom of protest? Yes, we're very much in favor of that. Free speech, we love that. It's just democracy we're not crazy about because we had that in the 90s and it produced chaos. Um, so, you know, it really, uh, elites have a really big opportunity to frame, uh, uh, you know, what, what uh, uh, you know, what democracy is. And I worry less about, you know, mass understandings of democracy than I do about elites using, uh, you know, particular definitions of democracy um, for uh, more narrow parts and ends. Yeah, I, just, I I don't have a ton to say on on this, except I, I think this question about cooperation um, by right wing populists is really interesting because, I mean, at least in the U.S. case, since nationalism is at the sort of at the center of right wing populism, it's hard to see what 
cooperation across countries would look like in that in that context. But I mean, it I mean, it might it might happen. I just don't. It's I don't think there's much of it yet. But it'd be interesting to see. Um, and I do think that in the in the U.S. case with right wing populism, there is sort of a movement away from democratic language. I mean, I think that Tim talked about. Senator Lee saying we're a republic, not a democracy, and Republicans kind of acknowledging, including Trump out loud, that, well, you know, with like really open elections, Republicans will never win, right? So that seems like, you know, maybe something that they wouldn't have said out loud six years ago, but would have believed now people, now people are willing, are willing to say, right? And the, the language is sort of save our country, not save our democracy. Um, so I do think there's a subtle backing backing away. But if I, I guess if Ira Katz Nelson were here, he would probably talk about the questioning of democracy in the early 20th century. And I guess I think of his book Fear about fear. And um, and you know if he <laughs> if he were here, he could talk to us about like what what happened to that. Um, you know the sense that democracy had failed in the early 20th century, and that it might it might come undone. And I guess I'm. You know, whenever I think about, you know, the fact that Trump has cha challenged a lot of democratic norms in American politics, I think about other presidents who have challenged democratic norms in American politics. And, and by, please do not, I don't mean to make this comparison so directly as I'm going to now, but F take FDR, for example, right, who was a president who was basically, no president ever served more than two terms. He ran for four. Uh, he threatened to pack the Supreme Court. He, um, you know, completely changed the relationship between the American government and the American economy. Harry Truman tried to nationalize the steel industry through an executive order, right? So this idea, I guess, of people challenging democratic norms in the U.S. has a long history and um, some from the left, some from the right. I, you know, I don't want to say Trump is FDR by any means, but there have been other periods of time, and you know that's the period of time that Ira is writing about in his book, Fear Itself. Okay, that's uh, actually uh, uh, a pretty good ending to to make an, uh, the argument broader and more comparative. I have to say, I like that Justin a lot, and we're going to <clears throat> pass to the second part. Uh, of, of, of the conversation. Um, and we have the pleasure of having with us two uh, fantastic keynote speakers, although one of them has not arrived yet. So um, let me start with the introductions and we will start with Jorge Castaneda, who is foreign minister of Mexico from 2000 to 2003. I don't think Jorge needs any presentation, introduction. He's a kind of very important uh, public intellectual and political scientists in the region. He's currently the Global Distinguished Professor of Political Science and Latin American Studies at New York University. He's also a foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, an international member of the American Philosophical Society. He was a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and a recipient of the John B. and Catherine MacArthur Foundation Research and Writing Grants. He has published so many books, I'm not going to read them all because then we won't have many time, much time for any presentation. And he's also very prolific in the press. Um, most of his works is on, as I said, the comparative politics, Mexican and Latin American politics, US and US, US Mexican and US Latin American relations. And his last book from last year with Oxford University Press is called America Through Foreign Eyes. So, uh, Jorge, thank you so much for having accepted our invitation, and you are ready now. You're muted, Jorge, you're muted. You're still muted. Okay. Okay, yes. Thank you, Vicky, for the giving me this opportunity to be with good friends and colleagues. Um, <clears throat> it's been a while since I've seen some of them, but it's an honor to be here with you. Um, I was following most of the discussion 
past half hour at least, and I hope I'm not repeating things that were said before. And obviously, some of the comments I'll make about the on the issues that you asked me to address will be similar to those that were uh, taken up at least in the Q and A part of the previous uh, panel. Um, I'm going to try and center my my comments on the very current uh, expression of what we could still continue to call populism in Latin America, um, because uh, it's a term that, I, of course, as Rob Kaufman and yourself, Vicky, and others know, have been used now at least uh, <clears throat> for the last 50 or so years to refer to traditional regimes in Latin America, whether they be the most notable case, perhaps, Peron in Argentina, uh, um, Getulio Vargas in Brazil, even Cárdenas in Mexico, and many other cases <clears throat> in Venezuela, in Colombia, etc. But uh, what has become rather um, interesting in the past few years is that we seem to have a reappearance or reemergence of uh, similar uh, phenomena in Latin America and several countries, uh, but with, of course, updating uh, with uh, uh, different forms of expressions, on occasion different policies, um, uh, but that still remind us of what used to happen. I I'd like to mention two or three of these uh, rather quickly. They're not all exactly what used to be the case, but uh, uh, they are, I think, common to many of the so-called populist leaders in Latin America today, whether they be on the right or on the left. And uh, they may even begin to conform a, a pattern of the way uh, they, they work. The first one, which obviously has its origins in previous populist leaders in the region, is this direct connection with the people. Except the definition of the word direct and the word connection and the word the people is different. <laughs> um, obviously, the great populist leaders of the past Peron uh, and others used at the time basically radio, that was pretty much all there was, uh, to have this kind of connection. Um, on occasion, they uh, connected directly to the people through labor unions or other types of associations. Uh, but the, the direct nature of the direct connection was very different uh, then, if only because uh, the mass media did not really become mass in Latin America uh, through radio and television, movies, uh, <clears throat> until the early 60s. Uh, today, what is very, uh, what's fascinating in the case of people like Lopez Obrador, uh, uh, Bolsonaro, uh, Correa, when he was in office, uh, Alberto Fernandez, and of course, the, the, the leader of all of these, uh, or the precursor of all of these, who was Chavez, is that that direct connection through the mass media, and I'll get to social media in a second, is really massive. In other words, there really is a way of reaching practically 100% of the population through television and radio and film today in most of these countries. And that is something which did not exist before, before meaning perhaps the first one to do this was, uh, was Fidel in the very early 60s when at least in the urban centers of Cuba, you had a high penetration of television in a lot of households or in some places where people could watch TV uh, together. But even there and even then, and it was in a sense the most modern advanced country in Latin America, you still did not have the type of penetration that you have now. So when you, you used to have, I who started this, I said, as I said, was Hugo Chavez, when he did his Alo Presidente things on Saturday and Sunday and or Sunday, uh, four or five hours on television, six hours on occasion, uh, so supposedly answering people's questions, but really going on and on, rambling on on whatever topic he wanted, regardless of the question. Uh, he really began this uh, way of establishing that direct connection in a much more direct way than in the past in any country, even in Venezuela. Um, 
Lopez Obrador does this pretty much the same with his daily morning press conferences. He's been doing this now for a little more than two years, every single day, with the exception of the two weeks that he was sick uh, with, with COVID. But other than those two weeks, he has been holding forth on, uh, on television in the morning, live, not on every network, but sufficient networks. And of course, you can also see it on social media every day for an average of two hours. Sometimes it goes on for three hours. Sometimes uh, if you have a plane to catch or something, uh, cut it down to an hour, but it's every single day. Uh, Bolsonaro does similar things. Um, and uh, even Alberto Fernandez is trying to do something of the sort, although uh, that I would defer to you, Vicky, uh, as to how often uh, he, he does this and how uh, lengthy he is about it. Um, so this is one of these sort of new ways of doing the same old thing. And uh, it is very effective in many ways because there is no way for any kind of opposition, whether it's an effective one or an ineffective one, really, uh, to um, counter this. In Mexico, it's practically impossible. In Brazil, it is very, very difficult because even if the media uh, sometimes can end up being opposed to the president, they were with Lula and they're beginning again to be with Bolsonaro, um, you never have the same amount of presence of time. In Mexico, you certainly don't, um, which leads, of course, to another common characteristic, which we see very clearly in the case of Bolsonaro, in the case of Lopez Obrador, in the case of Correa, when he was president in Ecuador, perhaps most exaggeratedly, but also with Alberto Fernandez, it was a very strange scene. I don't know if you saw it or read about it, Vicky, a couple of days ago in Mexico, or actually, Yes, it was in Mexico at the Mañanera, at Lopez Obrador Mañanera, with Alberto Fernandez. They hosted it together, sort of a, 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 a twosome there. And they both started off railing against the media, Alberto Fernandez against the Argentine media, and saying how they were doing terrible things about Vacuna Gate and about, in general, the vaccination process and the treatment of the pandemic and Lopez Obrador ranting and raving against the me Mexican media who according to him are all trying basically to overthrow him, uh, trying to stage a, a coup d'etat uh, pretty much like what happened to Francisco Madero in Mexico um, <clears throat> a little more than a hundred years ago. So uh, the two things, the connection and the going after the press are characteristics that are very clear as I said, of course, uh, uh, Correa is, is very much in the same camp. If anybody went further, perhaps, than others, it was uh, Correa himself. And in a way, uh, Daniel Ortega has been doing the same thing with the press and the media in Nicaragua. Now, the next part of this direct connection, which is so interesting, uh, is, of course, social media, which is, by Latin American standards or anybody's standards, as we were talking in the previous panel, is uh, something that is very recent. Uh, but these people have millions and millions of followers. Uh, they were often elected because of their uh, ability to use social media very effectively. Certainly that was the case with Bolsonaro and Lopez Obrador. And they continue to use social media uh, once they are in the presidency. Not only by tweeting themselves, it's not just Donald Trump, uh, tweeting every, you know, 50 times a day, or Alvaro Uribe, who's no longer president, but loves to tweet also. Uh, it's the presidency tweeting, but it's also an entire machinery that they've set up with enormous amounts of people in huge call centers with unlimited resources available to them to both praise and adulate and uh, exalt uh, the president for whatever he may be doing. And at the same time, go after any type of opposition, whether it's the business community, in some cases, in the case of Lopez Obrador uh, and Fernandez, whether it's the left, in the case of Bolsonaro, whatever that may be in Brazil on any given day, but with an entire machinery, whether it's businessmen, as I said, intellectuals, political parties, candidates running against them. Uh, and this is 
very common to all of them. Again, why? Because it can be done. Why, can, why do they do it? Because they can. Because you have penetration of social media of you know, upwards of 80, 85% in most of these countries. People have, you don't have that many people on Twitter necessarily, but if you add up Twitter and Facebook and Brazil and Mexico, WhatsApp, that has enormous penetration, uh, you can reach 80, 90% of the population that way. And there is no way that anyone can counter that uh, um, in return. So that part I find uh, also very interesting. Now, the next part uh, of sort of a common uh, trait, which goes back to also what we had uh, in the 30s and 40s, but I mean, with a much more effective way of doing it, is to establish that same direct connection, but between the money and the individual. If Evita gave away money from the Fundacion Eva Peron to people, um, she at the end of the day didn't, was not able to give away that much because first of all, she didn't have all that much. It wasn't that easy to reach so many people. It didn't necessarily last long enough, et cetera, et cetera. What these people are doing, again, Lopez Obrador, Bolsonaro, uh, Fernandez, um, and a few others, is, and Chavez began, began this very early. He began as early as 2000, 2001, and then really took off after 2003 uh, with the rise in the price of oil, is to give money away directly to the people, to the client, clientele uh, sectors of society. But we're talking about millions and millions and millions of people. Uh, in the case of Brazil, the emergency aid that came to sort of substitute or complement Bolsa Familia when the pandemic hit and they established this back, uh, I guess, in April, if I understand correctly, they reached well over 100 million people uh, with this stipend, which was higher uh, than Bolsa Familia. Lopez Obrador has set up an enormous amount of programs uh, where he hands out uh, different kinds of stipends to the elderly, to the handicapped, the indigenous peoples, to the young people who have no job and are not enrolled in uh, higher education, uh, and to enormous amounts of small groups, peasants, by having them plant trees and things like that. And it's an enormous amount of money, and it's an enormous amount of people. But this is him giving away the money like Evita Peron, obviously, except that it's more people and more money and it goes on for a longer period of time. Uh, perhaps Chavez's mistake, at least at the beginning, was not to understand that it was much a much better idea uh, in terms of maintaining popularity to give people money instead of giving them housing, which he was not able really to deliver on it, either they never got built or they fell apart once they were inhabited, or they were lousy anyway. Um, it, it, this sort of Lopez Obrador and Bolsonaro uh, and a few others are in that sense very uh, Friedman-like uh, uh, advocates. They prefer a hundred times to give the money away than to give anything else away even vaccinations, they haven't gotten to that limit yet, but they, it, I wouldn't discard it if all of a sudden one of these days they begin to give people a stipend to go and buy a vaccine. Instead of having the problem of being the state that uh, has to organize it and this and that and put it in people's arms and whatever, here's the money, go buy it, where, wherever you can find it. But just remember, I'm giving you the money to buy the vaccine but we could perhaps establish a certain parallelism between vaccines and, and money. Um, and this tends to work as long as you have the money. And we know because of conditional transfers that come from before the populist period, that it's not that much. Brazilians ran into problems because they really ran it up very high in terms of the universe of people, uh, the time frame, and the amount of people. But Lopez Obrador so far has not had that kind of problem. He's been able really to um, uh, 
continue to hand out the money. Uh, as in Brazil, in Mexico, and I also think in uh, the case of, of, of Nicaragua, and perhaps in Argentina, you'll correct me, uh, Vicky, they um, are able to maintain this with relatively stable finances. Brazil is reaching a limit. Mexico has not, um, and other places have not either. And uh, it works very well, which leads, if you're the one who's handing out the money, and you make this very clear to everybody, this is, you know, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's me who's giving you this. Uh, it can be enormously effective, we'll see, but it can be very effective in getting votes because you establish that connection, which by, bypasses political parties. Lopez Obrador is not interested in his party in Morena. He doesn't particularly care. Uh, uh, and Bolsonaro doesn't even have a party. He resigned a, a few months back. Um, they, that's not what they're interested in. What they're interested in is that the money they give translate into votes for them. If there are legislative elections, then it has to translate into votes for their party. But even in the case of legislative or gubernatorial elections, the candidates are always handpicked by Lopez Obrador, Bolsonaro, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is also something that we will be seeing uh, very uh, soon in other countries uh, because it works. How long can it last? I don't think it's, we have a way of knowing um, because first of all, the pandemic has shaken things up so much that uh, it, it's, it's difficult to figure out really where public finances are. It's very difficult to figure out, at least in the case of Mexico, how much of the money that is sent, let's say to the um, <clears throat> young people between 18 and 25 who are neither enrolled in school nor have a job, how much of that money really gets to them and how much is ripped off on the way, uh, you know, the old fashioned Mexican way. Uh, it's hard to, to say right now, but at some point we will know and we will know how effective these uh, systems are for, uh, in terms of getting votes. The last point I want to mention, because I don't want to go too much beyond my time, which is a strange characteristic of all of these people and certainly extends to both uh, Daniela Ortega and, and, and Correa, um, but of, certainly to uh, AMLO and to Bolsonaro, is that in spite of the rhetoric of one sort or another, um, they don't want to pick fights with the United States. Um, and this is a little bit something that the old populist leaders also had. Um, you know, uh, we, uh, I'm sure many of you rem who are listening remember uh, or have read when, when Lázaro Cárdenas expropriates the oil companies in Mexico in 1938, um, the first thing he tried to do was to try convince the United States to stay out of it, since the companies were mainly British and Dutch, um, and the U.S. really didn't have much of a much skin in that game, and because uh, there was a sort of ideological connection with Roosevelt and an excellent Rooseveltian ambassador of Mexico, Josephus Daniels, he was able to do that. Cárdenas didn't want to fight with the Americans. On the contrary, he wanted to have them sort of uh, uh, pacified, and he was quite successful at doing it. Wasn't entirely the case of Perón, granted. Peron, but uh, he also, I think, tried to keep things within certain limits. AMLO has gone out of his way to avoid any kind of difference of opinion, of uh, conflict, of confrontation with Trump during his first two years. And he's beginning to try to avoid it with Biden, although that's going to be more complicated. But he certainly did it uh, with, uh, with Trump. Uh, Correa, as you may remember, despite all his rhetoric and throwing the DEA out of the Manta base, kept the dollar, uh, which is about as pro-American as you're going to get for a left-wing populist. Uh, it, it doesn't come a lot more uh, pro-Yankee pro than that. Um, and Daniel Ortega, in his own way, at least until 
two or three years ago, and I think he's made, trying to maintain that sort of relationship, has gotten along actually not that badly with successive American presidents since he's been in office the second time uh, around. Um, Bolsonaro had it easy because he uh, was always, he loved to refer to himself as a Trump tropical. Uh, and so uh, it was simple for him in many ways to uh, identify and to avoid having any kind of conflict. But um, what will be interesting to see if this thesis holds up is that now that he's going to run into serious complications with Biden, whether it be on climate change and the Amazon, whether it be on trade, et cetera, whether he's also gonna pursue this line of avoiding confrontation with the Americans almost at any cost. We'll see, but if I had to bet on it, I'd say he will. He will tone it down and you know, say, well, yes, I understand the Amazon. Everybody wants it. Everybody wants to protect it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I don't like that. It's Brazilian, blah, blah, blah. But uh, we're willing to negotiate and to talk about these things. We'll see. Uh, I'd stop here if you like, uh, Vicky. Uh, I don't know where Saskia is. I can't see her, but uh, oh, it's sort yes. of in your... Thank you, Jorge. Uh, I have a... a... First, I wanted to tell everybody we're going to use the Q&A as before. If you have questions, it seems that Saskia is having some issues, so we're going to wait for her a little bit. But I think we could start the conversation with you, and since I have a bunch of questions. So um, one question is, you have written, you know, back in the, uh, when Latin America was having the two left, some of which included the populists. Remember, there was the kind of moderate and the radical left, and the radical sure. left was a populist left. And, and so it, it seems to me that at that time, you had the ability to distinguish uh, within the phenomenon that was also a very hard to define phenomenon. Here, you have made a presentation when instead you have looked at the common uh, points, the kind of direct connection to the people, the, the loyalty to the person, and that's how I put the distribute the money in person. Um, and also the kind of hand-picked candidates, really. Um, and this, I think, more strange uh, idea of not fighting with the United States. Um, and so I have a, a, a bunch of questions. One is, do you think you could also use your categories to distinguish between uh, types of Latin American populism, kind of current? For So you could think of a kind of more a uh, radical and a moderate, so, you know, the Evo Morales and, uh, but like Lula could be a moderate version of populism, so those uh, could still be, I, I would certainly think Alberto Fernandez, if you call him a populist, would certainly be a, a moderate, um, um, or you could divide left and right, as we have been doing before. Or uh, you could use the kind of Ken Roberts de definition of, you know, organic, populists who rely on organizations and are restricted by organizations like Evo Morales in the case of Bolivia. You see now that he's having difficulties in defining candidates that follow him. And those that do not rely on organizations and therefore have much, like AMLO, that therefore have much more power uh, over the followers. So do you see these categories as being useful if you translate them to populism? So that's in Latin America, that's one question. The second uh, question I have, um, actually the, the next two questions, and I'm going to keep on the side the relationship with the United States, I'm not that persuaded about that one, and I think have to do with populism in the region and outside the region. One has to do with what are the effects of the pandemic. You know, in the prior discussion, there was a lot of discussion of globalization, of technological change and the people who were in pain versus the kind of more uh, cultural aspect of, 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 of uh, the, the people who's disaffected and follows populism. The pandemic has really had a very uneven effect in the region in terms of increasing inequalities, those who could kind of weather the pandemic and those who could not, uh, very different effects across ethnicity and gender and all of these categories that are now relevant. Uh, and especially migrants, uh, which is another very important category. So do you think the pandemic would 
shape differently coming up how populism play out in the region or the world, if that's what you want to do. And, and thirdly, uh, in the first part of the conversation, we discuss about the tensions between certain types of populism and democracy. And the beginning of your conversation on the media, and especially social media, shows that actually, and I think Trump is the perfect example, the power to stop populism is called by a totally non-democratic entity, right? Twitter, Facebook, they have the power to silence Donald Trump. That's what they effectively did. But that's not very democratic. Uh, you know, these are entities that are totally unaccountable to any kind of citizens. So how do you kind of see that tension playing out? OK. Well, I'll, I'll try and address the three points, Vicky, uh, without knowing how, how much I really uh, can speak to them. You know, I, I try to sort of stay away from the left, right, or the types of left uh, uh, categorization now because uh, there are, you know, again, these complicated issues because of the more conservative or right wing or extreme right wing. Uh, governments like Bolsonaro, you know, it's not a minor issue. It's uh, it's the biggest country uh, around, um, and uh, it's difficult to 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 establish a kind of categorization just of the left if you have so many conservative governments in power today in Latin America, in addition to Bolsonaro, Chile, uh, Colombia. In Peru, it's well, hard to say who, who's, who's in power there any, at any particular time, but anyway. Um, I, I think that the previous type of taxonomy that you mentioned and that I participated in now about 15 years ago about the, the two types of lefts, so the populist left and the more uh, moderate left and where they came from is still valid for those governments or political parties or movements of the left in many ways, but it got confused over time. And uh, it's hard right now to say where they stand. For example, I mean, if you look over uh, the, the Bolivian case, which I know you, you follow much more closely than I do, and you know much more about than I do, um, Evo and now Arce, um, despite their rhetoric and their let's say there, there certainly was this anti-Americanism and a certain degree of perpetuation in power uh, with very uh, sort of somewhat authoritarian trends, did not seem to have a, a very radical uh, economic policy. Uh, it certainly wasn't Chavez by any definition. Maduro continues to do many of the crazy things that Chavez began but at the end of the day, uh, it, it's difficult any, at, at this stage to place Maduro anywhere. So I, I'm a little bit more tempted to try and find common traits of these regimes now in Latin America, rather than to classify the few left-wing uh, or progressive regimes that are there. Because in addition, I mean, I don't want to go into too much detail, but if you look at Lopez Obrador's stance on a bunch of issues, like abortion, like drugs, even like uh, um, gay marriage and now feminism or women's movement in general, uh, you're going to find a whole lot of similarities with, with Bolsonaro. Uh, in many cases, you can just substitute the rhetoric between one and the other and without skipping a beat. Um, Lopez Obrador just yesterday in reference to a candidate in the state of Guerrero who is the governor for his party who's been accused at least by six women of having raped them over the last 10 or 15 years but who he continues to, to support said yesterday that these stories about romper el pacto eh, patriarcal which is the way Mexican women are asking him to proceed to break with the I guess patriarchal pact or whatever the best translation is. And he said, well, yeah, but that's, that's an imported uh, 
phrase, that's not Mexican, you know, this is not the way we do things here. I didn't even know what it meant until I asked my wife and she, she told me what it meant uh, yesterday, but I've never heard of that before. And uh, that's, that's not Mexican, that, that's imported from abroad. Uh, you know, Bolsonaro could have said exactly the same thing you know, without, without skipping a beat. Um, on the pandemic, I mean, obviously what one of the, the clear conclusions that, that a lot of people are reaching in, in CEPAL, at UNDP, et cetera, on these issues, particularly as you know, is that um, the state state ca capacity to fight the pandemic and now to vaccinate turned out to be extraordinarily deficient in Latin America. Everywhere else also, granted, I mean, it's not, you know, there's a very few, live very small number of countries that did it right. A huge majority got it wrong, but Latin America got it wronger than practically anybody else did uh, in terms of the number of deaths by uh, population of contagions, et cetera, and now in the very slow rate of vaccination with the exception of Chile. Um, what all of these governments are trying to do, Piñera himself is doing it and it's working for him. His poll standings are rising and uh, the, the rights uh, chances of having a very large chunk of the, the votes in the new constituent assembly that will be elected late April are rising because of a very good administration of the vaccination procedure. Uh, conversely, people like Fernandez are in deep trouble, uh, not just because of Vacuna Gate now, but because it's been very slow uh, and they're handing out vac vaccines, you know, it's a sort of the potpourri of vaccines. If, if it's Monday, it must be uh, Sputnik, and if it's Tuesday, it's AstraZeneca, uh, and it's creating a complete mess in, in Argentina, and much more of a mess in Mexico, because since we've had much more difficulties in getting vaccines than other countries, uh, we have a greater hodgepodge of vaccinations. But in the case of Mexico, and I know it's also the case uh, of Argentina, I mean, uh, that's what they're trying to do. Uh, the, the people were in Mexico just yesterday, the day before. Um, they are trying to make the point. I mean, in Mexico, it's absolutely clear. You are being vaccinated right now, particularly with the elderly, because that's where they're starting. Thanks to President Lopez Obrador. But that's what the person who is sticking the needle in uh, someone's arm says to them, it's not just on television, it's not only on social media, it's not on the radio. The person who puts it in your arm is not part of the old standing health care system in Mexico, which as defective as it was, had come, it's nonetheless come along over the years. No, they've replaced those people with others, with teams of military, social workers, etc. Those are the guys who inject you and they tell you, and I mean, it's taped and everything, esto es gracias al presidente López Obrador. And then of course the next comment, because the TV picks it up, is, ay pues yo le agradezco al presidente López Obrador, I thank President López Obrador for the vaccine. Anyway, so we'll see how this works out, but they may be able to uh, compensate for the terrible mismanagement of the pandemic with an effective populist management of the vaccination process. We'll see, I'm not yet convinced, but uh, they, it might work out. And finally, you know, the question of silencing uh, uh, social media, um, it's become a discussion in Brazil and in Mexico because of Twitter decision, Facebook decision regarding Trump. Lopez Obrador says he wants to create his own a social network, a Mexican one, a national one, a Morena one, so he doesn't have to depend uh, on Twitter or Facebook. Um, um, Bolsonaro, um, my understanding, is doing the same thing with this mass transfer to, I think, the Telegram uh, from WhatsApp in Brazil over the last, uh, what was it, about two months since, since, uh, since Trump was uh, 
who is banished. Um, and I imagine it's happening in a few other countries, although the resources are not necessarily there. Yeah, it, it, they realize, people like these two realize very well that what happened to Trump can happen to them. They, they, know, they think it's around the corner and they're probably right. Uh, I, I think that they, 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 uh, they've got that right and I think they're trying to do something about it. Now, the issue of course is, is there an alternative to some kind of democratic, transparent and fair regulation of social media. I have absolutely no idea. I don't like the fact that these decisions are made by Twitter or Facebook, but I don't like the idea that nobody makes them either. I'm not sure what's worse, no decision or a non-democratic decision. I, I, I really don't have much of an idea. Okay, let me ask you some questions from our audience. Patricio Navia asks you, what do you think will happen in the midterm election in Mexico later this year? Will Mexicans punish AMLO for his deficient response to the pandemic or they'll continue to support him? And would also, where would you place Bukele, Bukelele, Bukele, sorry, in your analysis? The elections in El Salvador are this weekend and he's obviously going to be, uh, have a, a great, uh, you know, a majority of the vote. So I think it's a, it's a fair, and I, my, my reading of AMLO is the same. So I think it's a good comparison that he, he made in the question. Uh, well, uh, Patricio, uh, my sense is that uh, Morena is not going to fare well in the elections in June. On the contrary, I think they're going to do poorly and they may lose even the simple majority in the House. Uh, they may win most of the governorships that are up for, uh, for election, but uh, I don't think they will conserve their majority, either the two-thirds majority or the simple majority in the House. I think people will punish not AMLO, will punish Morena for poor management of the pandemic, poor management of the vaccination process, and uh, uh, poor representation. This is the first bunch of Mexican congressmen, the first in modern history, to be reelected. These are the first guys who are actually running for reelection. And a lot of them were elected because of the surprising nature of AMLO's victory in 2018. You know, AMLO just filled in the, 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 the boxes, you know. All right, so who's gonna be our candidate in the fourth district in Tamaulipas? I don't know, find somebody. Oh, can I, can I write in my, um, my nephew who really has nothing to do, uh, but you know, he's available and he really, well, what, what, what does your nephew do in life? Nothing. But you know he's a nice guy, so can I just write him in? Yeah, fine. What the hell? He's not going to get elected. Well, he got elected, and now of course he wants to get reelected, which is quite natural. I mean, if you're elected once and you can be reelected, but that's what you want to do in life: spend the next 20 years as a congressman. It's a, it's a great job. And these people have been incredibly useless as uh, as mayors, as congressmen, etc. I think they'll be they'll pay a price. I don't think it's the case with Bukele, although I don't follow him as closely, but my impression in the case of Bukele is that he would fit perfectly well in the description I gave before of both social media, the mass media, handing out money directly, and by the way, not fighting with the Americans. Um, he fits uh, perfectly well. Um, I think that uh, he hasn't been this, especially successful with the pandemic, but I think he's so popular and the FMLN is just in such terrible shape that uh, 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 they're gonna take a real shellacking as I think Obama put it once. Okay, thanks for that question. And yeah, both the FMLN and Arena falling very low. So Ken Roberts asks you, is there a tendency for Latin American populism to shift increasingly towards cultural identities and conflicts rather than more traditional types of economic concerns? I mean, in the case, you know, obviously Evo did that already and was very uh, successful in doing so. Um, I'm not sure any of the other ones have. Chavez always did play a certain ethnic or, 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 or a race card, Maduro a little bit less so is my impression. Um, 
I'm, I'm not sure you see a lot of that other than uh, in the case of, uh, of Bolivia. I, I don't really see it anywhere else. Where you could have it would be in Mexico, but uh, I'm, because of a series of phenomena in the, in the, in the, in the, in the country, perhaps uh, Alberto Fernandez with the legalization of abortion in, in Argentina tried to um, successfully try to uh, you know, capitalize on that and create a certain type of identity issue uh, there. In the case of Mexico, it's not going anywhere. It's not working, first of all, because as I said, Lopez Obrador is a very conservative figure. A lot of, I mean, I know all of you don't belong in that group, but many people in the United States, because they think he's, a, he's progressive, automatically consider him to be also progressive in issues that are uh, uh, um, litmus tests in the United States. But well, it's not the case. I mean, he's, he's, you know, all of, a lot of his supporters, for example, are big, big advocates of marijuana legalization. And he just keeps telling them, oh yeah, that's very interesting. Let me think about it. You know, we got to talk about it. This is something that has to be debated, blah, 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 blah. And two years have gone by, not to mention, of course, abortion and other issues. Um, on more identity politics, it's complicated for him. He hates the Spanish and he bitches at them as often as he possibly can. But the problem, of course, is that he can only go so far uh, because uh, uh, he's a uh, first generation Mexican, uh, second generation Spanish. So he can only go so far. Probably one of the reasons that he got so upset with Pedro Sanchez, who was the first guy to visit him back in January of uh, 2019, was that Sanchez took him a copy, a fair bona fide copy of his father's um, birth certificate in some place in, uh, in Northern Spain. I, I don't think AMLO liked that a lot. He didn't like to be reminded of that at all. So he can only take that card so far. Well, he does, but you know, he, uh, he, he, one of the few things I think he believes in are indigenous people rights because that's where he started his political work in the seventies. But he hasn't really turned it into something that, uh, that works a whole lot. He, he, he hates white, white chickens, uh, as he doesn't use that term, but the supporters do. He hates white chickens, uh, but uh, he hasn't taken it that far. So I don't see him doing anything like, uh, like say, like Evo Morales or things like that. And the country doesn't really lend itself to that that easily either. Uh, actually, uh, following up on, on Ken's question, I would say the opposite is true, right? Because both Bolsonaro was elected with a much more cultural message and is moving actually towards a more economically populist, you know, from the neoliberal started to, to you know, a much more redistribution, a state intervention, a more traditional populist in that sense. And AMLO is also, you know, originally had a very strong uh, evangelical following. And, you know, the fight with the feminists is, is still the more cultural aspect of his, uh, of his rule, of his administration. But it seems to me that, in fact, and, and in Argentina, even though the abortion was passed uh, a, couple, a month and a half ago, the, the discussion is really on the economy. I mean, any, anywhere in Latin America, it's interesting, even in Bolivia, that these cultural issues, uh, although with the Agnes government tried to raise them, do not hit as much as the economy. So if anything, I would think the, the opposite of, of what Ken says seems to be happening, uh, which is also risky because the economy, you know, you are very dependent on an economic outcome that is not always under your control. I mean, now the commodity prices are going up and interest rates in the United States are going down. So I guess if we follow Campella and Suco, you know, it's a good time to be in power. Um, but uh, I think these people are pretty sensitive to, the, to whatever is the economic performance of their countries over time. I mean, the pandemic is actually a good excuse, but over time that's going to be uh, important. Um, 
I, I, I'm still puzzled by your idea about the relationship to the United States. It does seems to me that Brazil and, and Mexico have no option. I mean, they've always been allies to the United States, whomever is in power. Um, the others seem much more like much more dependent on the party in government, right? So uh, Lopez, for instance, Fernandez was very anti-Trump, and now he's very pro-Biden. But you, uh, I don't see I don't see a relationship. And then you have the kind of Evo Morales, Chavez, who are always anti-American, no matter who's in power. Um, so I, I, I don't totally buy this idea that populists are those who do not want to fight with the United States. That is the less persuasive part for me of your argument. Well, let, 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 me, let me take another shot at it, Vicky. <laughs> um, for the case of Fernandez, I mean, obviously you're, you know much more than, than I do about it, but my impression is that, let's set the rhetoric aside for a second. He made several attempts to have uh, Trump and the Trump administration help him uh, first with the negotiation with the banks. And he actually asked Lopez Obrador directly to use his good offices with the Trump administration to help him on that. And even more so with the fund, uh, with the IMF and particularly now, of course it's with the Biden people. Uh, he hasn't had a conversation yet with Biden, I, I understand. Uh, that no, he has, he has, he has. Oh, I, I didn't know that because uh, his, yeah. his, uh, his minister said it hadn't taken place yet, but maybe it has recently. Um, and uh, they are trying, I think Fernandez is trying also to uh, try with Trump and tries now because, again, it's very similar to what you say about Brazil and Mexico maybe has no choice. I mean, he's not going to get any kind of reasonable deal in his negotiations with the fund if the United States is not on board. It's just not going to happen. Uh, yeah, knows. I I, I don't I don't disagree, but I don't see this as a constitutive trait of populism because you know oh. when you have no populist governments like you know Macri also was so was like also. take their relationship to China and to and to the United States. Everybody needs China and the United States, and so regardless of who is in power, you have a kind of good relationship in Argentina with China because it's the main trading partner and with the United yeah, States. Yeah. My, my, I'm not saying it's constitutive. I just think that it's a common trait which I find intriguing. Uh, I don't see, you know, I would have expected people like Lopez Obrador and even Bolsonaro now with Biden will see this will be a, this will be a witness test. How they respond to all of these things that are very different. But you know, I think Lopez Obrador's uh, stance with Trump surprised a great many people. Certainly surprised me and practically everybody in Mexico. And uh, I, I would bet that Bolsonaro's, and at the end of the day, coming around and uh, maintaining a decent relationship with Biden, with Biden will also happen. And I'm, I'm pretty sure, for example, Arce in Bolivia will also find a way to reestablish. They've already reestablished diplomatic relations, and I think they'll continue to try and uh, re uh, reengage with the United States. My sentence: I'm not saying it's a constituent; it's just it's just there, and I find it intriguing. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that's fair enough, and and it's true of most of these governments. I guess Latin America is still the you know. The, in the area of influence of the United States, and they are conscious, I guess, in their foreign policy of that fact. Okay, this has been a fantastic uh, conversation, and we are uh, reaching the end of our time. I want to thank everyone, all of the panelists of the first roundtable, Sherry, Bob, Justin, Tim, I want to be extremely thankful to you, Jorge, who pulled it out together because Saskia left us. Um, <laughs> and actually did a great job. And I don't know if we have had time for two, uh, given all at the length of this conversation. Uh, this was incredibly interesting. This is the end of a conference that we were hoping to do in person a year ago and got suspended right because of the pandemic. And we were hoping to be sharing time together. We'll see if it will happen, uh, you know, maybe in a year we will be able to do a second iteration and we, will are, we are able to be seeing each other in three dimensions. I also want to thank Esteban, 
Andrade, uh, Monica Trigo for helping put this together uh, for the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University. And I want to thank you all of you in the audience for ha having come and participate with your questions and comments. Thank you, everyone.